This is a more than just podcast production. Welcome to this podcast, season five, episode 13. My name is Dimitra. I am in Toronto, Ontario, and I'm joined once again by Jonathan Kuline in Mississauga, Ontario. Hey there, kids. And we also have Jaime Lopez Jr. on the line in Seattle, Washington. How's it going? How's it going? How's you survived going? Texas, Jaime. I Down did. In the, when's the Texas town of El Paso? Yes, that's where he was. Was it beautiful? Was it cold? Was it, what was it like? It was a lot warmer than the Seattle area, so I traveled on the day that snow came to the Seattle area, and it was, um, I don't know, I don't know what this is, let's translate this to Celsius, but it was in the mid-50s, low-60s, and then the evenings were mm -hmm. 30s and 40s Fahrenheit, so uh, not not bad at all. You know there's an app <laughs> for that? <laughs> it's called P-Calc, we talk about it all the time. Right, right, P-Calc, -P I can't spell P-Calc, there it is, P-Calc. I was watching videos uh, online of the uh, the smattering of ice in Seattle and how uh, people were playing bumper cars. It was really quite sad. It's like watching the Vancouverites <laughs> do the same thing. Really? Yeah. People the... were like careening down the hills, right? Well, just for, for the sake of follow-up, uh, $50 is 67 and 52 cents U.S. Or sorry, the other way around. $50 U.S. is $67 and 52 cents right now. And temperature-wise, from Fahrenheit to Celsius, it is 10 degrees, which is not cold, Jonathan, is it? No, that's not cold. Uh, 10 degrees, I'm usually wearing shorts, so it's yeah, fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm walking home from work and stuff, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was 9 degrees here the other day, just a couple days after uh, the Christmas, uh, during the Christmas break or during Christmas, and I was wearing a t-shirt outside, so. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah, and what, Jaime was sliding around in the snow and stuff? I want the sliding and stuff like just go to like Google and type in topographic map North America and notice how um, the Pacific Northwest. So Portland, Seattle and Vancouver, British Columbia are all in that crazy mountainous terrain. And, the, and they're also north of Toronto and long, longitude. Lat yeah, long, Toronto is lines? like essentially flat, I guess. It's like Kansas. The Kansas of Canada is what I'm going to declare from the topographical map. <laughs> you are, really? You are not wrong. The Toronto area is, well, it's, it's graded, right? Like, it's basically on a grade, because we used to be inside of a lake. So yeah. it's, it's basically just a lake basin. So it's just a flat, slow grade the further away from the lake you get. Yeah, definitely. But hilly, we aren't. No. Well, we make our own hills out of garbage. You know, Centennial Centennial Park Hill is made out of garbage. That's true. There's one in Brampton too. And there's also the um the island the islands, Toronto Islands. In fact, Billy Bishop Airport, that those that's all garbage too. I thought that uh, some of that was uh, subway fill. Yeah, well whatever. I mean it's like it's it's not natural, right? Is what I mean. No, right? no, no, no. Yeah, definitely, definitely. All right. Well, let's get on with the fact check. Actually, we did have we did have a, a fact check name that I didn't put down here. So, but we were talking about on last week's show or last two weeks ago show um, about checking with Jaime about what's going on with American stations like HBO becoming HBO Max or just becoming Max. You had a question about that, Jonathan. Do you remember when we were talking about um, how shows are like uh, Westworld is now going? It's now it's going to be called Westworld Prime from now on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it could, because they're moving things on to, uh, like, Freebie and stuff like that, right? So that was, I think we were yeah. kind of confused as to the, what the landscape is going to look like now. What did I, I heard something else. That, oh, MGM. The MGM's getting its own one, which is bizarro because MGM's now owned by Amazon. But MGM's getting its own streaming app, which is something else now, right? I'll have to look that one up. Uh, MGM. Oh, Epix. Epix is rebranding as MGM Plus in January this month. So the network is changing its name to MGM Plus. Okay. But MGM is owned by Amazon, and they're going to have their own app, but it's not going to be part of Amazon Prime. Oh, wait. So, like, Westworld is going to go to MGM Plus? No, because that's, I guess, what... Uh, Westworld is going to Freebie. Which so I, let me let me let me see if I understand this correctly. Having Jaime Lopez on the show is of no use to us. <laughs> well, let's, <laughs> let's maybe actually let him answer a question. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's all terribly confusing, and maybe this is a good time to pull forward one of my uh, headlines here. So, 
as I understand it, Discovery and HBO Max are getting you know merged together into a singular app called or channel, if you prefer on what device you're looking on, called Simply Max, which is bananas because HBO is the much better brand name that they should have gone with. But Warner Brothers is in a is in a fun mood here because they've been um it's weird that they're cutting some of the content that you would think is, well, that's like an HBO original. It should cost you like nothing to maintain, right? But apparently there are residuals or whatever costs that go into this that are uh, apparently too much for them to keep in the back catalog. And one of the things that I had for today's show was that the uh, Looney Tunes and the Flintstones are, according to this article on The Verge, the latest victims of the HBO Max purge, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense because that's owned by the parent company. So yes, maybe HBO Max needs to license it from uh, Warner Brothers, but Warner Brothers is the parent. So why would they charge you know, tons of dollars to their own service. It's just taking money out of one pocket and putting it into another, right? Like what? Yeah. What's going yeah. on? Like yeah. dollars. It, it's a really weird thing where they're, they're cutting costs. And I kind of wonder if HBO uh, Max or simply Max, if we just want to start going that, if Max will just become a uh, reality TV show kind of place, <laughs> or if they're going to completely purge themselves of stuff like uh, House of the Dragon and Game of Thrones or anything that like, looks at them sideways and is it pulling in just enough money to to warrant having it in the actual catalog itself Mm -hmm. it's it's weird and a little short-sighted to me although when i was going through this in my head i said well how come disney doesn't have any of these problems and i think one they don't have the 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 conglomerate of uh, you know various content providers that they all own it's it's a little bit simpler for disney and disney i think has a much better spot when it comes to merchandising and theme parks and other things that I think they can look at something like a Disney Plus. Like, yeah, it costs us X amount of dollars more to keep that content up. But you know what? It takes real good pictures at Disney World, right? So you put them in a costume and, and put some toys around them. Maybe that's the, the thing that Warner Brothers is missing out on. Yeah, it's weird, though, because there's all kinds of stories that we haven't really reported on because a lot of it is allegation at this point, and I'm not huge on reporting allegations, so I will put a huge grain of salt with this one. But there are a number of stories out there at places like The Hollywood Reporter and and uh, outlets like that talking about how now that there's been this regime change at Disney, where Bob Iger is back, that they're taking a hard look at how they're spending their money on Disney Plus, and that might lead to some changes as far as the volume of shows. Like last year, uh, and we'll talk about this a little later if we start talking about the 2023 Spocky Awards, which are coming up. If you look down that list, you're like, my goodness, there was a lot of content on Disney Plus. The amount of cho- shows between you know Marvel and and Star Wars and everything else that they were churning out. You know, it it adds a lot of instant content, but that doesn't seem sustainable. Like, that is a lot of money they're spending on that stuff. And now the rumor is that they're going to start scaling that back. So even Disney's going to have its limits. Interesting. All right. Well, we'll get back. We'll come to the Spockies later, but let's move on with fact check. Um, the We were talking last week about New York Times uh, had a listing or had a, an article listing for the amount of when you can take a pee break during the plots of... Um, of uh, way, Avatar Way of the Water, but apparently I was talking to a couple of friends and they told me that the New York Times does this for just about any movie that you go see that's, that's long. They'll they'll give you the uh, the rundown on when you can go relieve yourself or get some get that you know drip, big gulp refill or whatever, right? So because we were we were joking about uh, having to get DoorDash or something delivered in the middle of the movie. Um, I wonder how that would work. <laughs> um, I'm not sure they'd let them and, in the building, but you know. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, the other thing is that uh, uh, they can come to the exit door, right? You can just open the exit door. But um, uh, you were talking last week about King Kong. I believe that was the name of the movie that you said the documentary was not available anymore. I just happened to find it on uh, YouTube, but it's a YouTube movie and it's blocked in Canada, so we can't even watch it. But you can you can buy a copy of it, uh, standard def or high def from youtube movies apparently so i don't know how what how they deliver that like is it an itunes compatible or what uh, have no, you, I, you... I, because youtube is owned by google and google owns google play so now just as they've gotten rid of the google play app on your television and on your phone because now everything streams through youtube 
So oh, there's just a okay, section gotcha. on YouTube now for your movies and television shows that you've purchased. And oh, so the movies that I've like, I like, I think I have um, from the Earth to the Moon. I have that series as because I had I did the uh, DVDs or something like that, uh, and I had it in Google Play. So now I have to go over there and watch to go to YouTube and watch it, right? Yeah. So if you go to okay. your YouTube uh, app, come with what, me, kids, as I try this out. Yeah, yeah. And then you I'm go on down. My water it, device. Basically, it goes down and it goes down to your. Um, your purchases and stuff like that. So you go to your library? channel, and then, yeah, basically it gives you a list of, your like... Your movies the, and shows. That's it. Oh, yeah, your, look, there they are. The Matrix. I got The Matrix. I got from your, I got Apollo 13. I got, you know, wow, look at that. I got movies. Okay, shows. now, if you want to... Uh, uh, just imagine yourselves a few days from now when this podcast goes up. You're going to be able to hear the seismic shaking of uh, our number one fan screaming at his uh, device that he's listening this uh, to this on, because he will point out that... The disadvantage of the Google Play slash YouTube thing that they've done is that the quality Not 4K. of those, both audio and video, is quite poor. So if you're watching on your uh, phone, you probably won't notice a huge difference. But for example, if you were like, hey, I own a digital copy of this movie, I guess I don't need the Blu-ray anymore, you are mistaken because the quality won't be nearly as good. Yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't realize that. So now I have, I don't know how many copies of Apollo 13 I have because I have... You guys gave me the, the Blu-ray last year, and I think I have it on DVD. I'm sure I probably even have it on VHS going back that far. And also The Matrix, really, too. I didn't realize I owned that one as well. What do you know? Hmm. Yep. Yeah, I mean, even the, the stuff that uh, Xavier got for Christmas, like the Batman and Dune and Ford v. Ferrari, and that those all are on our shared uh, YouTube, Google Play stuff now. Oh, they're, they're, not, they're not iTunes? No. So there, there's been some, well, I mean, Warner Brothers never were because Warner Brothers uh, doesn't want to give money to Apple, never did. So they were always ultraviolet and now that's Google Play. But okay. um, because... Except that I lost all my ultraviolet movies, just yeah, for the record. Exactly. You know. and, and on top of that, pretty much everybody else except for a handful of studios have pulled out of putting in iTunes movies in their in their DVD copies because... They view now view Apple as a competitor. So even Disney, if you used to buy a Marvel movie or a Star Wars movie on DVD, whether that's a, a, a Blu-ray or a 4K or whatever, and it came with a digital download code, you used to get that download and you could download it onto the iTunes store. Now they've switched over. So all of those are coming through now and they're all going to the Google store, which means you can only watch them on YouTube unless you buy them completely separately because they don't want to give you more reasons to go to apple they want you to go to youtube that sucks it no. really does particularly because they decided that to make this move with the latest phase of marvel movies so i had bought over the years pretty much every blu-ray and then into the 4ks of the marvel movies because i wanted them at the sort of best quality that i could get at the time and everything after uh, avengers endgame Everything after that is now only available when you buy a copy of the DVD. It comes with a Google Play copy. But can you buy them on now iTunes? You can. And oh, if you okay. want to spend, they can get as cheap as, if they have a sale, they can get as cheap as 10 bucks a piece Canadian, which is not terrible. But when you think that they're cranking out three or four of these movies a year and you want to spend an extra 40 bucks just to have the digital copy... You have to make that. I mean, like, call. The, the, I'm sure there there are many people, like like Jaime, for example, is a cable cutter. Who, many people who will just buy the the digital copy and forego the uh, fabulous DVD, Blu-ray, you know, copies, which are going to be, you know, unplayable in ten years when there's no more Blu-ray players being made. Well, and again, I guess you got to ask yourself too: What are you going to do, or are you okay with the quality, right? Because the quality of a 4K Blu-ray is higher than. Well, it's higher than Disney Plus streams at. It's higher than Apple streams at. Let's do the math. I'm, what, 57 years older than Xavier, so I got 57 years more wear and tear on my ears and my eyes. 57 years older than him. Am I 47? What am I? Well, you assume I'm older than he is. <laughs> you are. You are. So <laughs> it's math, man. Don't get me started on math. Yeah. Let me, let me... It's 2007, right? Uh, no. no, 2003. 2003. Okay, so... Oh, well, it's almost... almost uh... Yeah. It's a long time. I think the number you're looking for is 53. Uh, okay, well, I said 57. I'm thinking maybe I'm thinking Foster. I don't know. Uh, that would be 55. 55. Okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> 
whatever. Point is, my point is, you know, my eyes are dim. I cannot see. I have not brought my specs with me. So you're saying 4K with 4K sound not going to matter for the long term? Well, depends on how close I'm sitting to the TV. I mean, I did I did go to Best Buy's um, uh, Boxing Day sales and look at the nice new, you know, OLEDs and, and all the QLEDs and ZLEDs and all the other LEDs that they had out there. They're very pretty. See. They are very pretty. They're also very big. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, because, you know, uh, kind of like con- con- considering how we, we upgrade our, you know, the TVs go from my workspace to Carol's to, you know, to the bedroom and stuff like that. Right. So as they move through the house. But yeah. Yeah. Because she still watches that sad, you know, one with the DVD, the DVD player that doesn't, in. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't work, which I told her not to buy. But what do I know? Anyway. Um, yeah. They, I mean, they served her purpose at the time. Anyway, I guess so. So that's our fact check. So let's move on to our headlines and some sort of weird, sad news. Weird, sad news. Yeah, weird, sad. I guess that's the way to to look at it. So earlier this week, we got the news that uh, Avengers star Jeremy Renner was in hospital in critical condition after a snow plowing accident. Initially, obviously, everyone was like, "Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god!" Um, here we are a few days later and apparently he's, you know, uh, regained consciousness. He's still in the hospital, but he's, you know, posting pictures and, you know, saying how grateful he is for, for the support that people have been sending his way. Apparently he's, he suffered uh, a number of injuries when, uh, a snow plow that he was operating uh, began rolling by itself, and uh, well, he was he was helping out a family member who was stuck in the snow. Yeah, on, on in his on his driveway, he had been plowing, and he they they managed to get them out, but then he, he the thing started rolling away, and he tried. I guess he tried to run and stop it. Have you seen a picture of this thing? It's fourteen thousand pounds. It says it's something out of a James Bond movie. I mean, yeah. In yeah. in Ontario, we use those to groom the the ski hills. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. This is not your grandmother's, you know, chain driven, you know, like snowblower. This is like serious hardware. And I don't, I don't know how you would get on it <laughs> if it was. It's got like treads on the side. Like there's, you know. So that's just what let it happened. run the trees over. The trees will the, stop it eventually. You know. Yeah. The the cops said basically he tried. He it started running away from him. He tried to jump up and get into it, and he missed and got thrown underneath the treads and got run over essentially so all that to say it's a very scary accident uh but for now it seems like he's in stable condition it seems like he's hopefully going to recover um you know he had to have surgery uh very scary thing obviously we we send him uh, our best or at least i do i don't know how you guys feel about jeremy renner but uh um you know i uh yeah i guess one he's of those hawkeye, like, man he's hawkeye you know well you mm-hmm. know it's funny because you know obviously we are we're primarily a, a, a star trek podcast you know this reminded me eerily of the anton yelchkin story right i was gonna say exactly his yeah. car yeah. you know basically he his car was not set properly it went you know, backwards and it crushed him to death. And it, you know, this, this talented young man was just gone, just gone. And it's just devastating yeah. and heartbreaking. And when I heard about this, I was like, Oh my God, like w- what if Jeremy Renner just died? Like that would be horrible. Uh, and yeah, it just immediately evoked the the same feelings I had when I heard about Anton Yelchkin was just like, Oh my God, really? Like that's devastating. So I'm, Really glad he's not dead, but uh, what a scary, scary thing to have happen. Well, I don't mean to make light of the snowblower thing, but like it, this is like something out of a James Bond movie. Like the the size of this thing, it's not it's not your you know petite you know device, right? So yeah, yeah. But <sighs> don't wear any yeah. loose clothing around that thing. Is I guess all I got to say, right? So Put that as scarf a, away. as a Spock cast, uh, you know, warning, uh, friendly announcement, public service. If your snowblower gets away from you. I think Tim's got the right idea. Let it hit a tree. If it's headed towards a baby, yeah, okay, yeah. Take take one for the team. Try yeah, and get the thing out. Sure. But if it's just sort of headed off in a certain direction, maybe just see how that plays out. Eventually it'll stop. You might run out of gas, but it will eventually stop. Yeah. Unless you live in Saskatchewan, in which case you can watch it run away for like three days. <laughs> it's good. That's, <laughs> well, as Jaime pointed out, Southern Ontario. Yeah. Well, we have hills here. We do have hills. Not enough to stop something that looks like from a James Bond movie. Well, that's true. That's true. 
All right, what's going on? What else is going on? Yeah, uh, so this is fairly quick, but uh, we were wondering when we were going to see Wakanda Forever, Black Panther Wakanda Forever. Uh, not obviously everybody could get out to the theater to see it, and you do not have to wait long to see it in the comfort of your own home if you have Disney+. Plus. Uh, it will be showing up on that service on February 1st in uh, here in North America, which is good news. Uh, it's... um. It's a strange thing, though, because uh, I know when it came out, you know, I think we were doing the math. I know uh, I know my son was doing the math, trying to figure out, OK, well, you know, they've sort of set this precedent of this window of time. It's usually about 45 days after it, it comes to the theater that's going to show up in uh, on Disney Plus. In this case, it's closer to 70 days uh, that they'll have waited before it's it's shown up. Now, obviously, there's lots of reasons for that as far as I'm sure they know when it's going to do the best by putting it on the platform at a certain time. And also, they wanted it to get the most that it could get at the box office. So there's lots of reasons for that. But uh, yeah, you're going to have to uh, you're going to have to wait a little bit longer, but not too long before you can watch uh, Wakanda Forever at home. Jaime, did you get a chance to see this or are you are you anticipating this one? I didn't see it, so I'm looking forward to February 1st. I can watch it on Disney+. Plus. So, yeah, you're right. It looks like December 18th would have been the 45th day. Uh, yeah. That is a minimum, not a for sure coming out in that sort of day. So it was a, like no sooner than 45 days. And given that the Academy Awards are Sunday, March 12th, it would kind of make sense to have a little bit of buzz going into that uh, event, getting people all hyped yeah. up about it. Yeah, I don't know when the nominations come out, but it'll be interesting to uh, to sort of see how that it does tie in. You're right. I wonder. Uh, I wonder who they will nominate, or what might get nominated from this. Obviously, the the first Black Panther movie got a, a score of nominations, did not really win much of anything, I don't think. Um, but you know, there's a lot of buzz around Angela Bassett. There's a lot of uh, buzz around uh, Tena Cuerta, um, and you know whether or not the the movie itself or screenplay, special effects, all that kind of stuff. So it'd be interesting. It'd be interesting to see if it gets any kind of juice off that. Cool. All right. Um, the next piece I have here is Amazon Virtual Studios, which is, uh, what do they call the thing in the Disney? It's basically an LCD panel kind of room idea where they have, um, sets, you know, like people are filming on these curved sets of the volume, they call it, I think Disney calls it, right? Where they, they filmed, uh, Mandalorian and things like that, where actors can actually act like the camera stays in sync with the, with the actual image. Uh, but the actors get a better sense of. Uh, hey, I'm on a savanna, or hey, I'm in the middle of the ocean, kind of thing, or I'm in the middle of space. Um, when they're when they're filming stuff, and actually, I think uh, it was in Helen Mirren um, sci-fi. I don't know if we talked about it. It's called Solo. I think it's a bunch of short episodes, um, and she plays a, a space traveler in one of them. Um, and she said it was very very interesting to sort of get the feel of of being in outer space, surrounded by stars. So this is just a. a Sort of Amazon's version of the volume, um, which is interesting. You know, I, when I was in university, I had an idea of doing something like an immersive sort of, um, like not VR, but like you're actually in a space where images are projected onto four walls in my mind. Um, but yeah, so this is kind of cool that they're actually filming filming uh, TV shows and movies and movies and stuff like that way. So, and this is a nice little video on the making of the vol of Amazon's Virtual Studio, their version of the volume. And that's cool, and then. That sounds pretty neat. Yeah, it is pretty cool. It's it's kind of a neat neat technology. Um, it, well, it reminds me. I don't know if you ever did you ever read Fahrenheit four five one. Uh, yeah, in like high school. Yeah, well, I don't know if you remember. The wife used to watch soap operas, and the soap operas would project onto the entire like walls of her living room. So she was actually in the in the, like she would have lines to read. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, like interactive. So, yeah. So it's same sort of idea. Like you know, if you're really really rich, you just have your TV show projected on all your walls, and you're you're one of the characters in it, which is kind of cool. Um, and, uh, we also got a, uh, a new trailer or sort of a teaser trailer for the 60th anniversary of Doctor Who, which is coming in 2023, it says. And I think if I check my calendar, I think that's where we are. Um, and this is sort of expounding a bit more on the David Tennant as, um, as the, uh, the doctor, um, sort of lost in time, lost in context kind of thing. And, uh, and, uh, Donna, um, his uh the runaway bride uh, character is uh coming back as she, she, i think she calls him skinny man uh, tammy would know for sure but uh 
Because there's a scene where she's like, she says, I can see him, I can see him. And she, he's hiding behind her mother. But, uh, and then of course you've got the, the new doctor, I've forgotten his name already. Um, but he, what the heck is going on here kind of thing is, is yeah. sort of said in that. So I'm not sure if that's going to be coming out for next Christmas. Uh, but uh, we didn't get a, we didn't get a holiday special this year. Um, we used to get a holiday special on Christmas Day. The last couple of years we had them on New Year's Day, but we had nothing this year. So um, after, you know, the 13th Doctor took her little sort of twisted journey, we haven't seen anything yet, um, except for we're waiting for the David Tennant thing. And apparently, I think we talked about this previously, he's going to be in two or three episodes as this sort of mid-Doctor sort of thing. Not really the 13th Doctor, apparently. So there you go. Or 10th Doctor, I guess, right? You know, he's not really the 10th Doctor. He's somewhere in between. 13.1? Thirteen, yeah, thirteen, zero, thirteen zero one. It's kind of a, it's a hot fix. What we call a hot fix, right, honey? And uh, exactly, <laughs> patch version, doctor. Yeah, patch doctor. Um, yeah, and then a uh, quick story here on Ahsoka. This is an article here talks about how, uh, and I don't know if this is like a clickbaity link, but that Ahsoka's news reveals how it will fix Kenobi's big mistake. Biggest mistake is that the fighting with Darth Vader. Is that it's supposed to be implied that? Uh, that was a mistake. So there, there. She may, in fact, uh, fight Darth Vader uh, before, like somewhere in the in between times between when he was the bad Anakin and and Darth Vader, or in I think what do they call it the the in between world uh, that they had in I think it's in Rebels, Jonathan. Yeah. So I'm I'm really confused by this one because in Rebels there's that whole like they actually meet and it, and that's sort of supposed to be a big thing because it's the first time that they're facing off in a lightsaber duel so i'm curious to see how they think this is going to come together i take these articles with a grain of salt because obviously they don't know everything but it could be interesting i think the idea is that you know yeah they, maybe she'll do something yeah that that obi-wan should have had done which is try and actually take a shot at darth vader so do you think there'll be a tardis accident involved in this one and she'll just sort of show up on the set and no oh i really hope not yeah we had uh spoken on previous episodes about the the money involved around the release of avatar the way of water and the fact that it was going to need to make a, a significant amount of money in order to break even given that it billion took, dollars yeah given that it took so much time and obviously the technology involved and and you know cameron uh, james cameron uh, noted Canadian director James Cameron was uh, working on this for so long. They were saying in order to recoup the investment on this, they were going to need to make around two billion dollars. It was going to need to be sort of one of the top five movies of all time in order to just sort of make its money back, uh, which seemed bonkers when we talked about it. I think in sort of November, we were like, Oof, "That's going to be a tough go." In if you add in all the factors about where we are in the world, where we are as far as our, our you know pandemic and everything else, well, here we are in uh, early January 2023, and this movie has now made 1.4 billion globally. is now the 12th biggest movie in history already. This uh, article from Variety is very interesting because it makes a point of saying that it has made most of that money, a lot of that money overseas. It's made. 1.025 billion at the international box office. So that means it's made, uh, you know, 400 million ish, a little less than 400 million in North America. That's, that's, um, that's an interesting fact, you know, Not jump change. Yeah. That's a lot of money on the international market that they're making out of this. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, I wonder uh, what this is going to do in the end. Like, you know, they're, they're talking that, you know, the way it's tracking. And I, I remember sort of saying over the holidays, I didn't really have a good perspective, but Disney really cleared the decks and everybody else kind of got out of its way. Other than a few sort of award fodder kind of movies and, and some kids fair, there really was nothing to compete against Avatar. And there really isn't even now until we get up until about, you know, February when we see Ant-Man. Like, you know, there have been times where we've been like, man, we've got to go see this movie this week because it only gets like a one week window in IMAX or, you know what I mean? Like we're, we're kind of, oh, you only have a short window if you want to see it in its best possible form or you're going to be seeing it in a, in a, you know, a side theater on a screen half the size with the less great sound in the whole nine yards. In this case, it's going to have an IMAX run of like two plus months straight. 
And on top of that, it's playing in AVX. And on top of that, it's playing in the 40X theaters. And on top of that, it's playing in all these different formats. And it's just playing on a loop, you know, five times a day at every theater. Like, that's a really good recipe for making a lot of money. That being said, $400 million domestic is not huge. That's, that's it's good. It's really good. But it's there are other movies that have done, I think, better domestically. Um, I'm curious. I'm curious to see what this little little freight train can do. Because again, they've got a clear sailing. There's nothing really competing against it until Ant Man comes out in February, and that's another month and a half. Puss in Boots is up there, you know, giving it a run for its money, and, and <laughs> apparently Top Gun as well, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Well, Top Gun ended up as the number one movie of the year just because of the timing of when it came out. It it had a longer run, right? Because of it, it came out in the summertime, but. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's kind of bonkers that uh, that it's sort of on this track, and they're going to have another almost six straight weeks of being able to just kind of go unopposed in the theater. You know, we're talking about the all-time biggest movies that it's on track to to head towards now. You know, two billion doesn't seem out of the realm at all, and you know, I don't think it's going to make the two point nine, which is the all-time record that it, the original Avatar has, but that includes a re-release and 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 and. So maybe, yeah, who knows. Sorry, hi Mary. Have, have you uh, seen Avatar, or uh, is is this still on your to to be seen later list? Yeah, I actually did see that uh, with family over the holidays. So saw it in in 3D and IMAX, which is probably how it's best uh, best meant to be. Jaime's broken his string of no movie theaters. I know. I was going to kick him off a of spot <laughs> cast voting if he hadn't gone. <laughs> Do you get to vote yeah, for you can uh, actually you can actually weigh in on the uh on the on the Spocky Awards now having seen this. Yeah, it's it's true. And it was definitely an experience of a movie. Um I'll have to see it again, you know, like either in a regular theater or Do you have to see home. it again? Do you really have <laughs> well, to see it again? <laughs> seriously. To see what, what it really is as a movie, right? Because Yeah. Uh, the spectacle we, is more blinding than the story. Yeah, we we've, we've talked about the, the first avatar you know, for me being a, a huge downgrade in, in grading when it comes to not seeing it in the theaters uh, or seeing it subsequent uh, to seeing it in the theater. So this one I've got to see as well, I think, to get away from the spectacle. But um, it certainly wasn't as easy to tag it as being, you know, like Dances with Wolves, uh, like the first one was. So at least it's probably a good sign that it didn't immediately jump out to me as one particular movie. Yeah. Maybe a, maybe a pastiche of other movies. Well, stay tuned, um, kids. We're, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about Avatar uh, when we get into our, uh, our recaps in a little bit. But uh, yeah, anyway, it'll be interesting to see how this thing uh, finally ends up on the, uh, on the all-time list. Again, it's, it's now the 12th biggest movie in history already. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Wow. <laughs> no accounting for taste, I guess. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and we already know um, what Tim thinks of it. Hmm. Well... Yeah, it was all right. I had a good nap. Um, are we back? Where am I? Are we on the oh, greatest hits? That one? That's me. Yep. Yeah. So I just saw this. You know, of course, it's the end of the year, so you get the the you know the the top ten lists and the greatest lists and stuff like that. We're not going to talk about the top two hundred singers of the world, but um, this was the greatest hits of the last hundred and twenty years, which is kind of interesting. So going back through you know time all the way back to eighteen ninety nine. Uh, up until last week, I guess. Um, and so I, it, I was surprised, actually, when I looked at this, the number of movies that actually do fit into our uh, genre. I mean, I guess we're not really looking at, like, there's a Frankenstein on here from 10, 1910. I don't think any of us have ever seen that one. Uh, or the Mark of Zero. I might have seen the Mark of Zero, actually, now that I think about it. But, I mean, like, uh, some interesting interesting um, King Kong, obviously, 1933 classic sci-fi movie, right? Um, Wizard of Oz, of course. Um, Pinocchio, the original Pinocchio, Citizen Kane is kind of a is kind of a, a bit sci fi ish, I guess. It's sort of futuristic, right? So, just to um, clarify, this this list is basically the the highest grossing movie of each year. The it is hits? highest uh, well, box no, office not sales. Quite, not, yeah, it's it says. Um, I think it was something about. Uh, it, it, well, yeah. Uh, it's the top it is a list of of top grossing most pop top grossing slash most popular movie of each year so not necessarily a top gross but uh could also because in some years he's got more than one movie right um like later on 
let me just let me skip ahead to like the times when we like you know things like the james bond things you know are kind of in here um i think around 1960s yeah, so 68 is, a, is space odyssey which is sort of, i guess sort of the first sort of sci-fi one that we would consider right um clockwork orange you know i'm just get, scanning through the list real quick um Whoa. star star wars something called star wars a new hope i don't know if i've ever seen that one um to, to be fair he's got the 1931 frankenstein movie on here that's, that's he's got the 1910 frankenstein on here. yeah so those ones are sort of yeah, yeah. in our milieu yeah. and yeah it, yeah he's also got um uh wizard of oz i mean wizard of oz is yeah pretty, i mentioned that already, yeah. yeah so strike empire strikes back so, so 79 he's got he's got um three movies apocalypse now and alien listed um, he's got Star Wars Strikes Back. Star Wars Strikes Back. Uh, I don't remember seeing that. Movie. Yeah, his list is a little um, light on grammar. Yeah, and and the Sh- and the Shining are both in 1980. Raiders of the Lost Ark, E.T., Blade Runner, uh, Return of the Jedi, uh, Temple of Doom, Terminator, Back to the Future, t- something called Top Gun. I don't know what that is. Yeah. Um, uh, Princess Bride. You know. Yep. Uh, Last Crusade. Uh, Ghost, which I guess is kind of sort of in our milieu. Yeah, um, Terminator 2. Terminator, yeah. Terminator 2, um, Jurassic Park. Um, Pulp Fiction would sort of fall in because we just like Quentin Tarantino. Um, <laughs> Independence Day, uh, Titanic, um, Star Wars. Star Wars 1? What? Oh, I that's Phantom Menace. Yeah. Phantom Menace, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the Matrix. Um, something called Mission Impossible. I'm not sure what that is. Um, Harry Potter, you know. Um, Lord of the Rings, you know, the, as we get into the 2000s, we're more like, you know, um, with Pan's Labyrinth, I guess is one. Yeah. Dark Knight, Avatar, Inception, Avengers, Gal- Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, Star Wars 7, <laughs> um, Civil War, um, Star Wars 8, uh, Spider-Man, Curtains of the Spider-Verse. It ends at 2022 with Top Gun Maverick, uh, but Spider-Man No Way Home is on, would pro- and Parasite would probably be the the last two that we've talked about on this show. So quite a few, I mean, not a shabby, uh, I think I did a rough count. Did I do a rough count? I can't remember if I made a note on this. Yeah. At least 25 are, are sort of within our sort of spark cast, uh, spark castable category. Right. It, it is so funny though. It really does speak to the, the idea of, you know, the geek shall inherit the earth. If you look at this list, you're right to me. Obviously, you know, we, we, we fish out the things that we like from earlier on. But it really does sort of, it's like, you know, 77 Star Wars and there forward, it's like sci-fi, 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 fantasy, sci-fi, fantasy, sci-fi, fantasy. Yeah. It really yeah. does start to pick up steam in a lot of ways, which is... I didn't see how mm-hmm. the Duck on there, though. You know, it's shocking, really. I, I remember that summer, just, you know, the lineups, the fervor, people with their shirts, you know, duck fever. It, yeah. was, it was everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. Jackass. Oh, well. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, uh, another sort of quick one. Uh, we knew that the last season of Flash was going to be starting in February, but we got a little extra reason to maybe uh, dip into the last season of this uh, um, sort of cult favorite CW uh, DC show. It's that Stephen Amell is coming back to reprise his role as Oliver Queen in the uh, ninth and final season of The Flash coming this year. Um, the Flash or Green Arrow? Oh, Flash. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. so he's coming back to play Green Arrow on the Flash show. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how long it. It does say an episode. I don't know if that's like obviously multi parts or whatever, but uh, yeah, it'll be kind of cool to see Stephen Amell back in Green. Uh, it's been a number of years since that show went off the air, so it'll be kind of fun to see those two together. Obviously, Flash debuted in the Green Arrow show. It was sort of a backdoor pilot, and uh, so yeah, it'll be fun to get those two back together. And, uh, yeah, last season of Flash starts on the CW on February 8th. Cool. All right. My last two stories here are just a couple of quick ones. One is, I don't know if you guys have heard of Kaleidoscope. I just found out about it the other day when I was looking at uh, one of our select lists or at work. They were talking about it. Um, so what it is is eight episodes of a Netflix series. It's basically about a heist, so not really in our thing, but um, it stars Giancano Esposito, who is um, from Breaking Bad, and, for, and he's the bad guy in, in um, uh, Mandalorian, right? Yep. Uh, or no, was it? Yeah, Mandalorian. Yep. And yep. Um, so he plays one of the central characters in this. And the way it works is, which is kind of cool, you watch the black episode first, and it, all the episodes are, are not are not numbers; they're colored. So black is first, white is the last episode, but all of the the other ones 
are presented to you on your Netflix app randomly. So in mm-hmm. other words, the order in which I am presented with them is different than the order in which you are presented with them. And apparently, you know, each sort of episode is self-contained, but they're all part of this bigger story, right? And apparently, the the gist is that how you, however you, end, whatever order you end up watching them in, will sort of color your color, your uh, impression of the story altogether. So it's kind of an interesting thing. I'm three episodes in, um, just sort of watching it this afternoon or this evening, and. Uh, it's kind of cool. I mean, the, the you know Giancano Esposito and I forgot the name of the the bad guy from um, uh, High Castle. I've forgotten his name now. Um, they play sort of uh, a, they work together at some episodes and sometimes they're opposed to, opposed to each other. Um, but they kind of get. I saw the, the episode I saw today where they were de aged, right? So I'm not sure if they did the de aging with makeup or like as it goes back in a 25 year previous uh, flashback. Um, and uh, yeah, I was kind of you know I was trying to trying to find uh, some hints anywhere online about if they did you know digital de aging of the two actors because they don't look they don't look quite. Yeah, it's not perfect because they they do look or maybe it's just my mind's eye sees these guys as as you know close to my age as as it were, right? Um, but yeah, it's interesting to sort of see how the, how they sort of, uh, how they've done that. But it's an interesting concept, I think, from, from the point of view, kind of like Bandersnatch, you know, that, um, m- you know, make your own adventure kind of, uh, Netflix thing that they did a few years ago. So it'd be interesting to see what, what you guys think of it once, once you see it, if you decide to watch it, right? Yep. Kind of a cool thing. And, uh, I, I'm on a mailing list and I saw this morning, one of the headlines was that Paramount was sued. And of course, when I went into the mailing list to read the story, I couldn't find the story anywhere. So, uh, just before a couple of hours ago, I just decided, okay, well, let me just Google Paramount sued. And, uh, it came up with two stories for Paramount being sued. Uh, the first story is, uh, the two young actors who played Romeo and Juliet back in the seventies. They're now, they're, they're now in their seventies themselves. They were they were 15 and 16 at the time, and apparently they were filmed in the nude. Um, the director said, "Oh, don't worry, you won't, no one will see this." Blah blah blah, kind of uh, thing. But apparently, uh, they're now being Paramount is now being sued for exploiting young people because uh, when they made that movie, they were not uh, they were not of age, as it were. Yeah, um, although it's it's a strange one because. There have been multiple cases of underage people appearing in movies mm-hmm. nude. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that have been, you know, sort of obviously retroactively, they've been more under more scrutiny. But in a lot of cases, you know, they did have, you know, the, the actor's blessing, their parents' blessing, whatever, uh, in those cases. In this case, they basically say they were misled. And that's a key factor in this one is they're saying they didn't say it was okay for this to happen that way. And I think that's sure. important. Yeah. To, an important distinction. I remember that movie. We watched that in high school, and and really? honestly, I think Xavier saw it in high school too. Like it's still a standard. It is sort of the definitive classic interpretation of Romeo and Juliet. There are obviously some different ones, but uh, I, I vividly remember it because I remember we were sitting in class, and all of a sudden it was like, oh, they're naked, and all of us were like, I can't believe we're watching this in school. So. <laughs> Well, all the more they scarred you as used too, right? I so. don't think scarred Oops. is the right word. I don't think we were scarred. Yes. I think we were just really no. surprised. Titillated? Yes, okay. Um I wonder what the root of that word is. But anyway, um the other so the other story that, that Paramount is being sued for, and I think this may have may have been more of a it's a bigger story financially, I suppose, is apparently the creators of Top Gun did not get clearance from the person who wrote the original Top Gun uh, article. Because apparently Top Gun was based on an article he wrote about the training of uh, these pilots, right? And it got turned into a movie starring your favorite actor, Tom Cruise. And uh, apparently they didn't clear uh, that for Top Gun Maverick, which is now, as you said, what, the number one movie in the box office this weekend or this no, last no, year? No, number one for all of 2022. Yeah. So, so yeah. So there's, uh, and, and that may in fact be one of the reasons why they decided to, to go forward with the, with the case. Right. But, uh, just an inter- interesting thing that Paramount, our favorite, you know, favorite, uh, theater studio thing that we're been talking about for the last couple of months. Um, and Jonathan and I are avoiding like the plague, but, um, yeah, just uh, interesting that this is happening. Hmm. Which brings us to the main part of the show, which is where we talk about something related to Star Trek and we are wrapping up. 
season one, surprisingly, <laughs> the world's longest season of uh, Star Trek Prodigy. And this is part two of Supernova, or Supernova part two, season one, episode 20. Mm -hmm. And I'll let you give your elevator pitches. <laughs> well, I went a little glib on this one. In space, no one can hear you self-delete. Ahmed, mean, do you have something? You know, I didn't realize you all hadn't gotten through Prodigy, so I didn't... Uh, I watched the episode, but I didn't uh, I didn't take notes on it, so I watched Make the... Make any notes? Yeah, this is back-to-back. I don't know if I can do one off the cuff that's any better than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ob obviously related to the uh, the choice that happens in this episode. So, you know, we left them on the cliffhanger. The cliffhanger was that the uh, Starfleet was destroying itself because of the, you know, doomsday device that was aboard the Protostar. In this episode, they're like, well, how do we get out of this? And they talk a little science gobbledygook. And what they decide is basically they have to rev up the Protostar to top speed and then basically explode themselves while going at top speed, and that way it won't destroy the universe. But what I what I understand about that whole theory was, okay, so the virus has already been spread to the Federation ships who are now happily blasting each other. Yeah. Right, because they all get that sort of red effect. Yeah. And are we supposed to think that just by removing the protostar from the environment that all of a sudden the virus is going to go away? Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't the strongest bit of writing in Star Trek history. No? Okay. No. All right. That no. was, yeah. No. Oh, well. So, in the process of this, uh, trying to destroy the protostar, uh, Hollow Janeway uh, commits uh, self-deletion, an act of self-deletion in space. And mm -hmm. so, uh, so, one of the crew has to sacrifice themselves, which, of course, as we always talk about Prodigy being Starter Trek, is a Star Trek trope. Somebody nobly killing themselves, including themselves with a starship. Or or, or self-destructing <clears throat> the ship, right? That's another one, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's giving, getting them ready for the inevitable time when kids who start with Prodigy get up to the other stuff and are like, I saw this on Prodigy. Yeah, yeah. What was it, Star Trek 3, where, where it's um, Doc, um, Doc Brown? Um, oh, Klingon as, Doc Brown. Yeah, as uh, yeah, Klingon, yeah. And he's like, what is it? What is this? What are the words coming out of this computer here? <laughs> and somebody says, it's a countdown. Yeah. A yeah. What? A countdown? Get out Boom. of there. Yeah. It's, yeah. uh, yeah. It's well-worn territory. This, this whole series has been kind of well-worn territory not in a perfectly pleasant way, but it's, it's certainly covers a lot of Star Trek ground. In this one, it did stretch a little bit of credulity in the, you know, uh, so the, you know, you're right. The protostar goes into, into, you know, mega warp or whatever they call it. And then blows itself up. The kids end up getting stranded. Janeway ends up, hollow Janeway ends up deleted. And yeah, suddenly for some reason that the virus, I'm not sure if this is how viruses work. You two work in uh, technology. Maybe you can clarify for me, but the, yeah, that somehow a virus just stops being a virus. Uh, yes. Yeah. Even though we've already established it spreads through communication, and anyways, so then so in my early early in my career of IT, you know, somebody sort of said, you know, you can stop viruses by not taking the the floppy disks out of the little plastic bags they come in, <laughs> little prophylactic. <laughs> Yikes! I think the guy who said that was pretty funny. I'm I'm sure he's not with us anymore, but yeah, yeah. Um. So yeah, basically, this whole thing ends with you know them for some reason. Even though they've been shooting at each other for a, a, dura a, a duration of time, not one of the ships, Klingon, Federation, anything is destroyed. They're all just like, that was close. We all just shot each other with our shields down, but we're fine now. That yeah, part also yeah. stretched credulity a little bit. And like, that doesn't seem right. And then, uh, like, how do you expl how do you how do you reconcile that for somebody who starts with this and then gets to Star Trek Generations, where they like lower the shields and they just start putting torpedoes through the hull of the Enterprise D? Like, yeah. What? Anyways, uh, all that to say, everything works out all right in the end, and they of course end up with you know our our beloved crew ending back on Earth, and you know they can't get into Starfleet Academy, but they get special status and get to join Janeway on her next mission, which is theoretically to go find Chakotay. So hello, season yeah, ex two. Except for, um, uh, what's her name? Gwyn. Gwyn. Yes. Gwyn's going to go off and find her people. Yeah. But I think like Boimler, she'll be back, right? Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. it 
doesn't make sense, obviously, especially now that they've started this sort of romantic kind of deal with Dal. It doesn't make sense to sort of be like, hey, So is it up. safe to say that no one was injured? Or I guess the Divine... No, not even the Diviner, right? Because no, nobody was injured in the making of Prodigy, right? Is that correct? What do you mean? Like no characters lost their lives? Uh, well, the Diviner died in, in part one of this. But didn't he come back? Well, the problem is, is that now it's all timey-wimey, right? So there's no reason why he couldn't come back in some sort of weird timey-wimey way. But he did get, uh, he did get, I believe, stabbed to death in, in part one of this two-parter. Oh, part one. I, I thought you meant part one of the season. I'm like, yeah, okay. Yeah. And the, the, whole, the whole split season thing was kind of messy, like I think. It almost, that's why it felt like two seasons almost, right? Yeah, it was... I, I think we talked about it in our previous episode. I think when you sit down to watch this on a streaming service and you can just sort of sit down and go through them all with a, a, a younger person, I think it'll probably make a heck of a lot more continuous sense. But yeah, in, in, uh, in, I, just, I just checked my notes. But in the first part of this two-parter, uh, Asensia, or whatever she called herself, um, stabs the Diviner and kills him. So, Right, okay. Theoretically, he is somebody who dies, and I guess Hollow Janeway, depending on... And I loved, I'd love to go down this road with you, but I won't, uh, if whether or not that's a sentient being, but she's gone too, so. Hmm. She had gotten so large with her experiences with the crew that she couldn't possibly save herself. Okay. So we've reached the end of the road, all right? We've gotten through season one, all 19 or 20 episodes, depending on who you believe. What are your overall thoughts? Hi, May. I think they're, they're still pretty positive. Um, it's a it's an interesting blend of a show where yes it's for the the kiddos but it also includes a fair amount of you know additional lore related to voyager characters so um if you go into it with that sort of mindset i think you'll be fine it's it's not uh, a mile a minute sort of uh you know callbacks or or lore adding like you might get out of lower decks um that's true but i also think that it um it does a pretty good job for what is again meant to be a Nickelodeon show. Like I'm a little surprised that um that they didn't keep it mostly uh with the, the kid crew and that they pulled in as as much as they did. Um and hopefully in a way that, that isn't too confusing for uh, you know, my first Star Trek sort of uh, viewers. Hopefully it's like all right, just let's kind of roll with it, right? Like do they know exactly who Chakotay is? Probably not. But um, I think there's probably enough there that like, oh, that's Admiral Janeway's like friend, right? Like, I think even a little kid could sort of get that. So um, I think it has something for, for kind of everyone there. Yeah, they didn't get into the typical sort of antics that you would expect from like a Nickelodeon kind of show where, you know, got this, this you know, eight people or whatever. And they just go around, you know, getting in trouble and getting out of trouble and, you know learning life lessons and that kind of stuff, like as you would expect in a sort of a show geared towards a younger audience, right? Yeah, it's, it's. I mean, we, we talked about the diviner, like they do do the, the cutaways from stuff. We didn't see him, uh, the actual image of him getting stabbed like you would in a more adult show, but it's it's pretty heavily implied, right? It's pretty clear that he got stabbed and died and became one with a force or or merged into Gwyn. I'm a little unclear. Yeah, midichlorians, yeah. 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 Anything else you want to say about John? You want to go through the Easter eggs and stuff, or yeah, um, the Easter eggs. I just obviously we. I think you mentioned last time that the Defiant. You can see the Defiant flying by. I saw that again today, but uh, I did see that uh, the Enterprise was there as well. So, but mm-hmm. no clarity on who was inside. So interesting. And something else I noticed. I looked up the uh, timelines, and it's kind of getting a little mushy because Prodigy. And Lower Decks and Picard are all pretty close in timeline. They're not the same. And and by Picard, I mean Picard the flashback, right? So when the attack on uh, Utopia Planitia on Mars happens. But yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see if these shows are all sort of ongoing, if they run into any kind of continuity issues. Because I think one happens in 2181. Uh, no, sorry, not 21. 2381. 2481? 2381? Where am I? 2381, I think, is when uh, one of these is happening. Another one's 2384, and one is, and then Picard is 2385. 
Yeah, so, so, see, I kind of, I kind of got the impression that initially that that prodigy was going to be like way in the future. Like you know, I mean, I mean, bringing Chakotay and and Janeway even into the show, um, kind of means that it's you know still on the tail end of Voyager space, right? Um, but yeah, because it's just odd that that they would they would want to tie it back so close. I, I I envisioned when they first when we first started watching the show that that this was sort of a future. Um, federation style ship that was so far you know like 2581 or whatever like i don't know what you just said but you know like like two or three hundred or maybe 500 years in the future right so yeah it honestly makes me grateful that discovery is far-flung future so i don't have to think about it yeah 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 exactly yeah somebody online that when you look at what happened with the uh, and i might have these in the wrong order what happens with uh, the Texas class automated starships in lower decks, the um, the AI construct in Prodigy, and the upcoming Picard, um, you know Mars attack. It kind of makes a little bit more sense that the Federation would be really anti uh, artificial intelligence because their premise here that this person posted on the internet was. Essentially, like, what if, like, 9-11 happened three times in the span of about five years? How would people be feeling about things? Uh, probably a lot different, right? Uh, you know, one one tragedy is one thing, but uh, the seemingly same tragedy continuing to happen from a single source of or similar sources. Maybe why it's not unreasonable to see what happened in uh, Star Trek Card. Hmm. Yeah. I guess uh, I guess we'll see as these shows go forward. I, I can't even recall. Did you have any of you seen anything about a Star Trek Prodigy season two? I haven't seen that they've announced that. Um, no, let's check I don't the think IMDb I've seen a direct announcement, but I also don't recall if we ever talked about there being like a like a lower decks esh. Uh, you know, they signed up for two seasons from the get go, sort of thing. Just given yeah, the expense of starting yeah. up, yeah. Yeah, it says 21, 21 episodes, which means there is they've got a slot on IMDb for a season two, but there's no, no, nothing lined up and nothing. You're right, like I haven't heard anything about it other than that. Hmm. So there you go. All right, and then uh, let's can we move on to Willow or yeah. All right, so yeah, so Willow, we're talking about two episodes, I believe. We're talking about uh, episode six, the Prisoner of Skell, 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 Skellin, Skellin? Skellin? Prisoners of Skellin. And then the uh, uh, Beyond the Best Shattered Sea, which is sort of the goal of, of this um, sort of macguffin place that they're going to go through. So, um, yeah, why don't you give your, your pitch there, John, and I may if you got one. Yeah, so we'll, we'll start with the Prisoners of Skull in Episode 6. Uh, after Willow and Kit are captured by the trolls, the rest of the Fellowship races to the rescue, and as usual, it does not go as planned. Surprise, surprise, surprise. <laughs> Yeah, mine was a bit more trollish around like the return of Mad Mardigan, you know. Oh, yeah, nice, yeah, just <laughs> clickbait version. Yeah, exactly. But that was fun. Just, that was fun. I yeah. liked that they did that. That was a fun twist. Yeah, and yeah. perfect well, I mean, casting. The whole, the whole how they find him, and yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, and and all sort of within the same, you know, like uh, Christian Slater in the same sort of um, era of actors as as, as Val Kilmer, Kilmer. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, yeah saw, cool. I saw a quick interview with him on, I want to say, Entertainment Weekly, uh, where he basically said that the way that they got him was that the, you know, the um, creator of the show basically said, you know, I started thinking about, like, who would be contemporary and who would make sense if this was somebody who went off. If this was basically, if the sequel to Willow in, in the 1980s had happened, you know, four or five years later... Who would have been the stars? And it would have been Mad Mardigan, and they would have tried to hire Christian Slater to play his sidekick. Right. And so they called him and said, "That's that's exactly what they pitched." Was basically like, "You would have been the perfect like one A and one B with Phil Kilmer in this movie. What do you think about doing it now?" And he was like, "Yeah, a hundred percent." So very cool. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I like the I like the the one troll guy who has the the calming voice. Yeah, I I don't know who played him, but yeah, he was. Uh... Interesting. It's sort of a twisty, sort of, you know, you expect him to have a deep, you know, sort of growly, you know, um, evil person voice, but he just had the sort of, you know, casual business guy kind of demeanor, right? Yeah, it was funny because our only other experience in Willow with trolls is the troll 
at Tiras Lean when uh, mm-hmm. it, they're sort of these, you know, mindless screaming, you know, sort of much more uh, primitive type creatures. So when you sort of see them come in, you're like, well, this is going to go badly. And he, yeah, you're right. It just sort of throws you completely for a loop when he's like, so who here is Alora? And you're just like, what? what? <laughs> but it was good. And it, it was a nice back and forth between him and his, I can't remember, cousin, brother. I think they mentioned that, uh, that you know, the other person and the other person is much more like, you know, a little more dull-witted like you'd expect a troll to be like yeah i'm gonna cut off their head and murr. and he's like now we don't need to talk like that that's what lowers our level so so the uh, the guy who I, i'm gonna assume this is who they're talking about his, his name is Derek arnold and he's he's been in he's played characters in jurassic world he's played in solo he, solo he's played in rogue one and in this he's called the upper management troll <laughs> i love it yeah yeah, no, he was really good. He was really good. He definitely made uh, what could have been a really double part very funny and interesting. Oh, yeah, and they had Jack Kilmer do the voice of Mad Mardigan. Yeah, because he's reaching out from beyond the veil, right? Like when, when right, um, yeah. Kit's yeah. being called to the other side. I, I, I figured that must have been that, yeah. So cool. basically the crux of this one is, you know, the whole thing's a, is a, you know, a rescue adventure. They're, they're stuck in there. The rest of the group goes, gets them. Uh, there's the part where, uh, of course, Alora drops the wand and, you know, you're just like, oh, no, the wand. And, but then it falls down the bottom. And, of course, later on, they just they find it at the bottom when they get to the bottom. Like, yeah, OK, well, that checks out. Um, well, the trolls do keep the floor, pr- you know, pretty clean at the bottom. Surprisingly of this pit, right? so, you'd think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Especially when, again, if you flash back to the original Willow movie, which I just rewatched over the holidays because um, uh, Xavier had never seen it. So we sat down and watched it. And uh, at one point, Val Kilmer, as Matt Mardigan, steps in a pile of troll dung, which is just in the middle of the Tira's League courtyard. So could have gone really badly. Mm-hmm. True. Um, but this one, yeah, really the only sort of milestones is that, uh, you know, they end up with the the full armor that uh, the MacGuffin armor that Borman's been chasing around after the the cuirass. And um, so he, he can actually, you know, get that going now and the episode particularly uh is notable because it also ends with uh eric in the uh was it the oh god what do they call the city is the something or other city at the end of the shattered sea oh god i don't know what they're the immemorial city or immemorial city that's right good good call Jaime. good good remembering um but we end up with him, and he discovers that he's not alone in the city, that there's this other person, um, to which I wrote down in my, in my notes on my phone, clearly the crone in disguise. <laughs> so um, if we jump from that to episode seven, um, yeah, episode seven, the, the Fellowship enters its final and perhaps toughest biz, bit of its journey, but will they make it to the immemorial city with their minds intact? So this was a sort of a mind-screwy episode, right? Everybody has these individual crises including eric in the in the city uh as they all sort of draw nearer to this sort of uh end goal and end place but um yeah and of course eric's story in this one is that he's he's sort of being wooed by the crone disguised as this beautiful young woman and everybody else is sort of going through their own existential things even willow is sort of cracking as is you know the, the the shattered sea is sort of shattering their little minds uh so badly that even even uh warps the makes makes a mudmander sad but uh yeah Jaime, I mean, what do you got for your for your uh pitch for this one mine was uh eric talks to a girl while the crew has a training montage <laughs> yeah it was a great <laughs> montage good yeah. call yeah, yeah. I, I i wrote down montage with an exclamation point <laughs> I, I think the best pew 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 was probably Elora and Willow training, right? The stuff that they very clearly yeah, chose for the trailers definitely. and said, this will look real good in the Disney Plus trailers. Yep. yep. <laughs> Although that scene where they're doing the, the Mudmander getaway, I like too, that uh, where, you know, we don't really expect it, but all of a sudden Graydon uses his flute as a as essentially a magic wand and blows oh, one yeah. of the yeah. gales out of the sky. Yeah, definitely. That was kind of fun. Yeah, it turns out, yeah. And did you did you not notice that Laura Dannon's hair kept getting oranger? It's, yes, clearly. Mm-hmm. Clearly she's starting mm-hmm. to sort of, I guess, as she gets more magical, we're supposed to sort of forget that that's not how hair dye works, but sure. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, it was different shades of, of orange because it was an always sometimes it was really dark orange and then sometimes it was light, lighter orange and yeah yeah the um there were some good quotes in there too uh i'm not a great sorcerer i'm just a farmer who got lucky from willow that was a really good yeah, one yeah yeah yep um and and i liked graden i shall name you kenneth the, <laughs> the yeah. mudmander <laughs> yeah <laughs> just again i like i like the the tone of this show it's never taking itself too seriously. It's what I liked about Willow in the first place. And I think mm-hmm. I didn't feel it as much in the first couple episodes. The first couple episodes seemed like they weren't for me as much getting the tone, but as this sort of group has sort of coalesced, as we've gotten sort of further into the series, it's done a better job of mixing that sort of action with humor, you know, princess Bridey, we talked about that, uh, but even just like the old Willow, it was just, you know, in spite of your best intentions, sometimes you're going to mess up. And in this case, you know, they're all sort of, oops, you know, like it's nobody's taking it too seriously. Although this episode did have some harsh moments, too. Again, everybody's sort of going through these different crises. You know, Borman tries on the, the cuirass and it doesn't work for him. And yeah. well, uh, even before he did that, he says, that, yeah, yeah, I'm not who I think I am at one point yeah yeah just real existential stuff you know and Graydon's of course struggling and and you know he's not sure and then you know an interesting moment there where he sort of confesses his love to to uh Alora, which is kind of interesting too right yeah you know i think mm-hmm. we all kind of saw that coming but it was kind of a little out of the blue he was just like by the way i love you and i know you love eric but you know i wanted to tell you anyways like whoa okay She's in the middle of like something like a heated moment at that point too. Like yeah, it's not not the appropriate time to have this conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I put that as my question was uh, was are we are we sure that how this is going to play out? Do we think you know they're going to resolve this? Uh, are we going to get a she chooses Eric, she chooses Graydon? Are we going to get a conclusion? I feel like you know this doesn't need to be a typical Disney Plus. Hold my beer finale coming up next week it feels like you know in an hour they should be able to tell a somewhat satisfying conclusion after this sort of the hike to get there but i wonder if it wraps up in a neat bow or if it wraps up with a by the way this could continue kind of vibe yeah hard to say my quote and my big question were both related to eric so uh the girl uh who we believe i think to be the crone in disguise um, has a great quote of, oh, I'm the Prince of Tirasline. Want to scrub some laundry on my abs? Which <laughs> yeah, says, a lot, like that. says a lot about his character as we've uh, mostly seen it. And then my big question is, what has Eric become? As he certainly seems to have had a transformation from all of that uh, pink water that he was drinking and that he was being... Yeah, he got a haircut, uh, which is, you know... I don't... I don't know why all of a sudden when you turn evil, they give you a haircut. Is that like an indoctrination thing? Hmm. Well, you're supposed to be like, yeah, I think just to, to make him look different. You're, now he's a different person kind of thing. He, he learned how to button up a jacket and... Uh, yeah. 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 Did up his shirt. Exactly. Yeah. Um, how are you guys feeling about this as we now enter into our, uh, you know, this is now the penultimate episode? Yeah, I don't know. It's 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 it was an interesting sort of it was a bit of Baron Munchausen this kind of epi- this particular episode, right? Um, if you've ever seen that show or movie, but um, yeah, again, I don't I don't know. Eight eight seasons or eight, eight shows per season seems to be. It always feels short. Like you know, by the time you get to the seventh, you're like, oh, it's almost over, right? And and then like, how are they going to wrap up all this stuff? I mean, there's a lot of a lot of loose ends to wrap up, really. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, again. We talked about in a previous episode, they were talking about, well, if there's a second season, they could find a way to bring Val Kilmer back and yada, yada, yada. But I guess it depends on, you know, all the numbers and the costs and everything else. I Personally, I hope they continue doing it. I'm enjoying it. And I, and I like being back in this world. I hope they do do more. But I, I don't know. I have a bit of a sinking feeling about this one. I haven't really heard a lot of buzz about it. So I'll be curious to see if it, if it uh, and, you know, obviously Disney's got some money, but they're not going to just throw it away and throw it away. They might just be like, hey, and this wraps up the whole thing nicely and walk away. I don't know. I think I'm looking forward to the finale. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. All right. And then uh, we had uh, Bad Batches or, or Bed Batches come back. Um, <laughs> and uh, so... Uh, oh, a Kiwi two, joke. Too easy, too easy. Too, I know, I know. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. 
but uh, we got two episodes, and somebody mentioned that they they referred to Aurora or Omega. What was her name Omega? Omega, yeah. As a her. Yeah. Omega is meant to be female. Yeah. She's a clone, right? She is. But she's a female clone. She is. And she's cloned from the same guy who plays Boba Fett. Apparently. Okay, that would explain the Kiwi accent, I guess, right? Which is um, why I definitely want her to be played by uh, Morrison, just just straight up. <laughs> no, no changes whatsoever in the live action version in like Ahsoka or something like that. There you go, just lean into it. You, know, you can have the new haircut. Yeah, on his knees. He can stand on his knees, right? And be a short person, yeah. Yeah, so we got two episodes here. Um, Bed Batch um, Spoils of War and Bed Batch uh, Ruins of War, yep. which, you know, they were kind of, I mean, my one comment about this show is a lot of pew pew, right? Oh, well, yeah, yeah. You know, I don't, I don't know, there's, there's not much, you know, there's a little bit of character exploration with, with Omega's, you know, development and stuff like that. She's obviously moved on from where she was in, in the first season. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, so kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, my my elevator pitch was uh, riffing on the fact that there was two in one in each episode. There was Indiana Jones references uh, or homages. So I had uh, Indiana clones in the castle of Dooku: colon, Raiders of the Lost Swag. Uh, yeah. the The opening scene was a clear riff off of the opening opening of Raiders of the Lost Ark when you know they've got the treasure and they're running towards the ship and she's fishing and yeah it was very much a riff off of that the opening of that uh, the classic where does the lost ark and then later on when uh omega is trying to get the treasure out of the uh the the case that it's in and is trying to sort of reach for it it was just like the part in uh, indiana jones and the last crusade of course when you know uh at first it's um it's the the evil nazi girl who's reaching for it and she falls and then it's Indiana Jones himself trying to reach for it. And, and, uh, his father saying, you know, you have to let it go. And that's exactly what like to, yeah. to the letter. That's what they yeah. say in this one. So yeah, I, I, I enjoyed the Indiana Jones references. Uh, obviously they're there for old folks like me, but, uh, yeah, that was, I like that. Cool. And what was Wrecker's new toy? Did he had a new gun or something? Well, he, he, they, they basically, they take apart part of a tank, right? They hook up the power supply supply to, a tank gun and then he's carrying it around right okay yeah so at one point let's i have that in my quotes too he says boom i make a pretty good tank yeah mm-hmm. Jaime, what was your uh, elevator pitch for this one mine was the only way the crew can truly live free is if they can pinch dooku's booty <laughs> <laughs> i love it yeah Yep. Yeah, so they end, up, they end up with nothing at the end of it, though, right? Because they, they drop it down in the chasm. Yeah, I mean, they end up with a kaleidoscope. Does that count? Yeah, well, and, it's cool. And, and Wrecker gets to actually walk away with the big gun. That's true. That's true. Yeah, that's what I mean. I saw him sitting with it on his lap at the end of the, yep. end of the episode. Yep. Um, yeah, the, the big question I had from this one is, so they don't want to kill other clones, so they set their blasters to stun. So they're shooting at them, and every time they're having a gunfire exchange, the the clones are trying to kill them by using, like, actual blaster bolts, and they're shooting back using stun blasts. But then they also shoot them out of the sky and kill them, and they also eventually grab a tank gun and start firing at them with that and dropping rocks on them. I have a tough time understanding the somewhat questionable morality of the Bad Batch. Are we are mean? we are we not killing clones? Because they're trying actively trying not to kill the clone their fellow clone troopers by using stun blasts, but then they also yeah, they shoot things out of the sky, clearly killing pilots. They shoot things, you know, like on multiple occasions they, they clearly are killing these people, so I'm I'm a little confused as to whether or not they're actively trying not to kill them and they're just accidentally killing them. They're they're only killing when they have to. How do we interpret this? Yeah, I don't know. Well, this is Troop Ninety Nine. The they're the the outcast guys, right? Like they're the yeah, they're 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 basically yeah, the the bad batch themselves, right? They're they they are clones, and yeah. they're trying not to kill other clone troopers. Yeah, but then I'm surprised they at do how kill good they aim, though. Troopers. You know? Yeah, they seem to actually have pretty good aim. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Well, and, and well, and then there was sort of the the 
everybody saw it coming, but the twisty ending, you know, with the uh, with the one guy saying you need to falsify your report because I don't want uh, uh, is it Tarkin? He doesn't want Governor Tarkin, Tarkin or the Emperor. Out, yeah. He doesn't mm-hmm. want Tarkin to find out about this about losing the booty or whatever. Yeah. So yeah. Speaking of good aim, he puts a hole hole, hole through the captain and sends him mm-hmm. off the cliff. Yeah. Yeah. Was that I mean, a did you have a, know a from... big question or a uh, uh, any good Easter eggs? Yeah, since I I wrote my notes uh, in episode order, the first one was: Will they keep any of that money, or only escape with their lives? And it seems like only their lives plus the kaleidoscope. And then yeah. my my second episode's big question was more around: Will the old man survive and become meaningful in the future? Because it it. Uh, it could be a one-off. It could totally be a one-off, but it also seemed like uh, like maybe they return back for some reason, or the old man had to escape because the Empire came in and plundered and destroyed everything. Yeah, it's funny because at one point he is sort of like, you know, oh, you know, I'm not from around here or whatever, and they're like, well, clearly we can register your, your domicile, and they, they so uh, tech, tech knows where it is, right? And so they go back there because, uh, you know, Tech's got a broken leg and they have to go back and, and find a place to rest. So they're going to back to his place. I'm like, and the other clone troopers, the, the ones that are still working for the Empire, wouldn't be like, hey, there's a heat register coming from over here. We'll just go find that guy and, you know, torture him until he tells us what happened. Either you're well, either you're good at hiding or you're not. And if if Tech can figure it out in like, what was it, four or five seconds, it seems strange that the other clone troops couldn't. I did have, yeah. uh, there are definitely some good quotes between the two episodes. Um, the exchange at the beginning of the first episode, why is Omega hang- hanging off the ship, says Hunter. It's an unscheduled study break, says Tech. Um, other than not being able to steer yeah. or control yeah. where we land, I'd say this is going quite well, says Tech. And uh, and my favorite was definitely, boom, I make a pretty good tank, boy wrecker. That was, I like that one a lot. Did you guys recognize Wanda Sykes as the the voice of the yes, uh, mysterious yeah, stranger yeah. in the first episode? Yes, yes. Exactly. Yeah, she was uh, my Easter egg from the first episode. Yeah, Fee Genoa is what they they have listed her name as. P H E A G N O A Genoa Genoa. Yeah, I think um, you know this is kind of what I expected for the first you know episodes back. You, you're you're right. It was a little pew 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 heavy, but I think they kind of want to grab people with the action part of it right off the hop. I, I didn't find last season was all pew, pew, pew. There certainly is no sh- shortage of it. It is, it is sort of an action-based, you know, it, it's meant to be a little more action-intense part of the Star Wars universe. This is, you know, they are a group of, of essentially, you know, well-armed mercenaries. But, um, yeah, I, this is kind of what I was expecting for sort of a two-parter to start the season was, you know, let's give us a good quest. Obviously, tying the Dooku into it was kind of fun where you're like, what what did what did Dooku have? What do you kind of get a little you know, curious? Like, what you know? Why 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 are they going to Dooku's mm-hmm. castle? What could that be like? I found that a little disappointing. I was like, when they got there and they're like, oh, it's already loaded, and you know, it's all in these containers, and you only get to see like a small portion of it. I was like, oh, I kind of wanted to see like, what was Dooku's castle castle like? What was you know, what was in all those containers? Like, that's a lot of containers they had there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So I feel like mm. that was a bit of a missed opportunity, but it really, it would have probably just slowed the plot down if they spent too much time going like, ooh, spooky, evil Jedi castle. All right. Should we move on to the way of the water? Way of the water. Way of the water. Sure. Get your head wet. Yeah. So. Are we, yeah, are we doing d- spoiler or spoiler free? Should we, should we we'll, put a- we'll do. I mean, there's no point. There was what, what, what's possible spoilers could we give for this movie? Really? Um, <laughs> Well, according to the internet, lots of people have seen it already. So, well, yeah, well, but but that said, I mean, like, what 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 story points do you really feel like are even worth giving away? Right. I, I mean, really, the only thing you could spoil is just sort of the ultimate fate of all the characters involved. Yeah, which it's it's kind of neither here nor there, to be honest with you. Um, so, I mean, some interesting ideas, like I mean, the whole idea of having Sigourney Weaver play a fifteen-year-old, um, you know, play her her progeny, right? That was kind of an interesting angle, because, I mean, like, why couldn't you just get some, you know, young, up-and-coming actress to play that role? Um, I didn't recognize Kate Winslet at all. Um, I don't know. I mean, maybe the... I don't know if you if you can see her face in the... Yeah, I did notice that the... In the case of Sigourney Weaver and, and um, Worthington, is his name Worthington? And, and Zoe Worthington, Saldana, yeah, yeah. They look a lot like their, their avatars, yeah. right? 
Um, and, and in a sense, Sigourney Weavers did as well, like as a younger, younger her. But um, I mean, the young actresses who played actors and actresses who played the kids, I mean, I have no idea who any of them were. I did check them out on IMDb afterwards to see who they were. I, apparently, the one that played the young, young kid is, was actually a young actor at the time. Um, interesting idea. I mean, the, the thing is, like, you know, it was just way too freaking long. I mean, I don't know how to put it any other way. Like I can't, I mean, like it could have been, they could have thrown away like an hour of that movie, you know? Um, Cause it had some typical story points that again, we don't have to go through the story points, but it had some typical, you know, um, things that happened. Like you said, like we, we anticipated before going to see it that, you know, the humans get sent away and they're going to come back with a vengeance. Well, guess what? They came back with a vengeance, right? Um, there are a whole lot of questions about the whole avatars. Like, how did how did we go from you know the humans being in these containers that are projecting into these avatar bodies to being in the avatar bodies? Like, you know, and then how did Sam Worthington's character impregnate somebody four times? Right? Um, yeah, it didn't didn't make sense. You know, not, like, not to the, mention the uh, as you and I were laughing in the theater. The immaculate conception of yeah. of the Sigourney Weaver uh, avatar yeah. from the first one spontaneously she... generated. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. the thing about this, we don't know. I mean, like, you know, I think is the answer, right? But again, exactly. But again, the like the whole the whole trope of alien beings have to have two eyes, two legs, a nose, and a mouth, mm-hmm. you know, and ears. I know the whole Star Trek explained it, everything, blah blah blah. But I mean. They don't, I mean, they don't necessarily need to reproduce by having, we do have, hum, there are creatures on earth that don't have to have a male and a female to reproduce, right? Yep. Um, there are organisms that just, yeah, a, reproduce a new child sexually, comes out yeah. of its side, right? You know, yep. um, I think Hydra is one of them and Paramecium are another one that where they just spontaneously create new, new generations. But, um, so, I mean, that I mean, I guess to make it fit into most human beings who don't understand the science of things, um, to fit it into their mind, there has to be a mom and a dad, and a, you know, and kids, and kids come from the mom and dad kind of doing the dance, right? But, um, yeah, and then the whole, you know, too much of the swimming, and and I mean, the, they went back through the the main the main protagonist antagonist, you know, getting himself one of the flying beasts. You know, they had to go through that whole thing again that you know a lot of that stuff could have just been just ended up on the cutting room floor right yep um yeah and and it's kind of like they kept having these revolving stories that would just go on and on and on and on and then at the at the end of it you have the big you know skirmish and and the, the final Which played and stuff very like much the same as the battle the final battle in the first movie like very very yeah. very 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 similar yeah i mean the you know they had the whole Poseidon adventure swimming through the sunken ship part you know they 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 pulled out all the stops in all the old 70s disaster movies like uh, all those tropes uh, one question i have about um metal you know when metal cuts and it and it's fatigued and it shatters and it splinters and it breaks into pieces and yet they're they're able to swim around and grab hold of these jagged edges and not slice yeah. their hands open that's the part i don't know <laughs> Little things like that. Those those things catch my attention. No attention to detail sort of stuff. But yeah. And my other concern about it was, and I'm going to finish talking. You guys can talk about it in a minute. But um, my one concern about it was, it, I knew going into it was too freaking long, which is why we were trying to avoid going to see it late at night because I knew I was amazed at how long I actually did stay awake for the movie. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> I think I I think I nodded off probably in about somewhere approaching the third hour, right? Um, yeah, because the the big climactic moment, I had to say to Jonathan, "How did that person end up in that situation?" Yeah, because uh, yeah, I just missed that whole piece. But you know, I guess I didn't miss much according to what you, how you described it. But um, yeah, the sort of you know, you know the the how did you know, the the, the battle ends and then there's the how do we get out of this situation kind of thing and 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 yeah like you said very pretty sort of i mean the big giant whale scenes were huge were cool and the swimming with the you know swimming with the fishes as it were was kind of cool um but yeah i don't know it's just too freaking long <laughs> well uh, uh now that we've had tim's report jaime what did you think of this uh especially for your first time back in the theater in a long time yeah i 
definitely appreciated the the spectacle of it the the tech that goes into what they did was pretty impressive like the uh dolphin-esque creatures that they ride in this one um uh, the skin looks like you know rubbery and wet just like you would expect for like a dolphin and it it looked like it was there there's uh some whales that look like they're like on national geographic right like the, that mm. part is is really cool and the 3d was was pretty effective uh i think there was one part uh that i could say oh yeah like that's definitely going to be in the avatar ride right like you're definitely going to be uh chased by that that creature um, <laughs> especially as it comes towards you uh but there were mother other uh there were other minor details that uh you know when you're immersed kind of tricks your brain like they're i think they were I think they were on the boats uh the you know the the evil guys the the evil new zealanders were 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 chasing the whales and they splashed water um towards the camera and it's the most minor thing but i blinked instinctively thinking that it was water mm. right and like oh like clearly i know better not to reach out and try to touch the the jellyfish and stuff they're floating by but the water uh, was enough to get me and make me think that it was coming there if only momentarily so Again, from a spectacle standpoint, it was great. Uh, the story, you know, you could kind of see where some stuff was going when you have the the sort of rebel younger son and the older son that kind of mm-hmm. tries to keep it together. Um, the the young love. And the sharks and the jets. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm a little surprised that nobody is really talking about how the first movie was Native Americans and this movie is Native New Zealanders. Right? Like yeah, it's clearly the clear. Maori, yeah. Maori, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tattoos, haka, uh, uh, dances and stuff. Like, that's... Uh, I'm, I'm surprised in this day and age we're not seeing anybody talking about that. But at least it does add something to the lore, right? Like, they are recognizable as uh, as Navi, and yet they're, like, adaptive and different enough, right? They're they're not quite as tall and lanky as, like, the the jungle monkey, I guess, kind of creatures, the the first navi were supposed to be and these ones are more uh stout thicker aquatic with fins adaptations so um i appreciate it for those things and and since i knew it was uh i think three hours and 12 minute movie going into it um the sort of uh, pro move was to do what i did if only unintentionally and eat lunch that is uh a thick beef noodle soup um it's like you know, going to be saltier, right? With a fatty broth. And then go into the theater, also have some popcorn with, you know, carefully metered out soda, uh, sorry, not with soda, water. And it felt like I kept my hydration in this perfect balance of never really <laughs> having to pee because <laughs> all of the salt sucked up the water and then I've rehydrated just enough to to keep myself from from feeling parched. Well, that's uh, for somebody who hasn't been to the movies in a couple of years. That's excellent. That's that's great work. It is the opposite of what happened to me when I was in. I think I was in high school. Probably, uh, I'm going to say it's probably like sophomore year of high school, going to see Independence Day, or maybe it was closer to to junior senior year, uh, going to see Independence Day. And in those days, when there was no assigned seating uh, that you could reserve, me and my friends we got in line. We were in line for like 45 minutes to an hour for our showing and munching on popcorn and soda and other stuff. And 15 minutes into what I believe is like a two and a half, if not two forty five movie, I just had to pee so bad and refused <laughs> to leave. <laughs> surely, surely uh, coaxing danger of a, of a UTI uh, inevitably occurring. <laughs> nice. Nice. Um, yeah. I, I, I... I guess I got exactly out of it what I thought I would get out of it in that, you know, I I didn't go expecting it to be the most uh, affecting story of all time. I went because I know James Cameron is an absolutely visionary filmmaker, and I knew I was going to see some cool stuff. I think it is the best 3D I've ever seen. I think it is really impressive as far as the visual effects. Like, you're right, Jaime, that the textures, the way that things moved in water, the way that, you know, even when people were coming in and out where like there's you know, droplets and it just, it felt very, very realistic. When you step back from it and realize that what you're watching is essentially an animated picture, it was 
very vividly real at times. Um, I'm curious, I mean, we saw it, uh, we didn't see it in IMAX because uh, Tim and I split the difference and went to the theater that's sort of halfway between the two of us and we watched it in, in the Ultra AVX, but with the high frame rate. And I don't know if it's the same in, in the IMAX, but the, the high frame rate was almost a little distracting in the same way it was for the Hobbit movies. It almost was a little off-putting at times. Did, did you have any issues with the sort of the, the, the look of, it, of, of how it was being shown at you? No, I didn't encounter that, which makes me wonder if I had the high frame rate or not. Um, I'd have to see if the, the theater offers that. Um, I don't yeah, think, I think the, the IMAX was, was high frame rate, I thought, for us. Could have been. Yeah, I mean, it, for, I found it a little bit, not necessarily nauseating, but just a little bit like my eyes were not necessarily fully grasping everything. You know, and and they say obviously it it lends a fluidity and and you know there are I understand the reasons why they do it, but I, I'll be curious to watch it again. You know, I imagine the next time I'll see it will probably be on Disney Plus, but I'll be curious to watch it again on a different type of screen and probably without those kinds of bells and whistles to see how it presents the second time. But I found that that took me out of the movie experience a couple of times because so I was just like. It's it's almost a visual distraction in its way. Like it wasn't enhancing my experience. It was almost it was almost inhibiting my experience a little bit, which is not ideal. Mm -hmm. But I mean, yeah, it looked fantastic. It was just as the way, you know, 11 years ago, the first Avatar really pushed the, the needle forward on some of the, the 3D effects and the visual effects. This moved the needle forward again. That's what James, Cam James Cameron does. But I'm not sure that makes up for the fact that it was a pretty thin movie. I get what they were going for. Obviously, this one, they were trying to, you know, the first one's a love story. It's about the two of them, you know, falling in love amidst this sort of, you know, uh, backdrop of, you know, indigenous versus colonial colonialism. This one, same thing, you know, uh, almost two two on the nose, two very much the same, you know, they're just learning how to do things and they're getting used to it. But then the bad guys come in and, and, you know, there's the whole scene with, you know, the, the space whale and, you know, you know, very much like the tree thing that happens in the first one where you're just like, Oh, I hope it doesn't have, Oh, it happened. You know, it just, there was not really any beats where I was like, Oh, I didn't see that coming. Like it was all kind of paint by numbers, which is unfortunate because if you're going to go to the expense of having this like hugely dynamic movie, and there's some very talented people involved, you know, on and off the camera. I, I really wish it had a little more of a resonance. Um, uh, I can't remember the kid's name. Chim Chim the Space Boy, the, the one who's like uh, Tarzan, um, who's the human. Spider. Spider, yes, Spider. Uh, I, I just, that whole like, you know, he's a... A poorly groomed human being who walks around with barely any clothes on and thinks he's a Navi, that that I found really quite off-putting as well. I was like, this feels, you know, just weird. And yeah, just didn't didn't enjoy that part very much either. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would say if you have the opportunity to see it in a the theater, go see it in a the theater. It's cool and it blows up really good. But do not go in thinking that this is a, a you know, a storytelling masterpiece. This is not a triumph. This is not, uh, you know, you will probably remember what you saw, but not what happened. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a Disney ride. It's not, you know, in, in terms of that, it's there, you're there for the spectacle. You're there for the experience. Um, it just, it has a somewhat of a story stuff does blow up, mm -hmm. but, but I mean, like, you know, if you look at, if you look at the stills that are on IMDb of like the whales coming out of the water and the, and the, you know the 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 effect of atmosphere and the 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 sun you know the light coming through i mean it's very photographic very sort of film like filmic that way like a national geographic kind of um presentation but yeah i mean that's you know i mean i i guess you know for, it, it does push the craft forward in terms of like um its quality what was that first um Oh, it was a, it was a, a video game you guys used to play uh, where the characters were. They, they, I mean, the problem I had with it, their foreheads didn't move. Um, it was an animated uh, movie about ten years ago. Um, it's like one of those, you know, 
adventure 12 kind of thing. It's like a, it was a video oh, game. Oh, like Meet the that, Robinsons or something like that? No, no. It was like, oh, what, what are those? You know the games where you used, where the ones I hate where you, 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 you take a shot and then the computer takes a shot and then you take a shot and then... Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like what do you tur- call turn-based RPG kind of... Final, Final Frontier, Final... Final Fantasy, final, yeah, Final Fantasy. Final Fantasy. Yeah, yeah. There was a Final Fantasy movie, right? Yep. And and they had this sort of thing. Like it, Polar it's Express? Taken, uh, Polar Express? I think was well, one Polar like Express is another one, which, like, you know, like, I don't know if you, if you remember the very first bunch of Pixar movies that came out were very plastic and very sort of, you know, objects, you know, rendered with light effects on them, but they looked like plastic toys like toy story right mm-hmm. all the way to now we've got this thing where um is this an actor portraying this or is this somebody's somebody animated like none of these figures that like these figures were all motion captured right um even though their their textures and their skin and all that kind of stuff is all done by digital artists the movement the voice the you know the acting the each actor got into a swimming pool and, and acted out their roles while holding their breath kind of thing, you know, mm-hmm. or they, you know, if they were on, on dry land, they were, you know, the, the young, young punks were picking on the young, the young kid kind of thing uh, for real. But then they just took them and replaced it, replaced them with these, these digital bodies and like fire effects and water effects. I mean, I'm looking at some of the stills as I'm talking and, and they look very much like they're, it's photographic in a sense, right? It's, it's amazing from that point of view, but, in the same sense that you know, going to Space Mountain roller coaster would be would be an experience, you know, or going to see a movie on on the Cinesphere at Ontario Place, kind of thing, right? Um, it didn't have to have a story if it was just going to be, but it, but then again, you wouldn't pay the kind of money you would pay if it was just like an hour of James Cameron, you know, um, blowing our minds away with visuals, right? <laughs> kind of thing, right? Um, but it, but it, but it's that it's sort of it's taking the movie magic to a whole nother level. Like um, you know, like two thousand one was it was a was a movie magic that took you know took people out of their comfort zones into space. Right? Star Wars was one where they started using computerized, computer aided motion graphics or um, you know filming the the models and with the really cool effect that sort of took the the craft another level up. Right? The Matrix was one where it took the level of craft higher in a sense right uh, avatar the first avatar was like an amazing 3d because 3d was kind of a gimmicky you know it was in the 50s it was in the 60s it was in the 70s never really kind of you know hit its stride but avatar was sort of the first movie that that sort of put it you know into the mainstream where everybody just sort of said you have to go see this and put on these goofy glasses and watch it for two hours or however long it was right so i mean it, it is sort of rate but i don't think in the same sense that, you know, it's like this, like if you take Avatar as the iPhone, the, you know, the one that came out in 2007, that was an amazing earth shattering product that's kind of, you know, it's tilted, it's started industries and it's, it's tilted the whole world on its, on its ear. And now I've got this iPhone 14, but it's, it's, a, it's a, it's a version of that first phone, but it's not. It doesn't. It's not sort of changing the paradigm that much further ahead than than the first iteration did, right? So, um, the Avatar movie. You know, I think I think what we you and I just were disappointed about going to see it a couple of months ago when we went and saw the the first one when it was back in IMAX in 3D. Um, you know, it it didn't have this. It was still a good movie. It was a still still had a you know great effect on us, but it didn't it didn't give us the sort of very first time we saw it kind of. Uh, amazement right because mm-hmm. it was because we had seen and and you know spider-man no way home we'd seen avengers we'd seen all these other attempts to do this kind of this kind of um, use this 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 stuff i mean so it i don't know i mean and i knew you and i were i was commenting on it because we kind of got to the theater kind of late-ish and and we had to throw our three glasses on before we were even accustomed to the the light in the room and i remember remember my saying to you the 3D doesn't look right in the pre in the trailers, mm-hmm. right? Because you know my eyes hadn't got used to the thing. I'm wearing I got a new pair of glasses, so the first time I was watching a movie with those glasses on, you know, plus trying to get the 3D glasses to stay on my head, because um, it's weird when you have when you wear eyeglasses and you put the 3D glasses over top, right? Yep. Um, so it took a minute. You know, we saw the Mario um, pre uh, preview. I forget what else we saw. We saw a few things, right? Mm-hmm. And it just, they just didn't, it didn't work for me. It wasn't working for me. And then 
you know, the Avatar movie started and the 20th century logo came up in high frame rate, glorious animation. And it looked amazing, you know, yeah. like that's when I realized, okay, now we're here, we're here for, we're here to have our eyes treated. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, and that and that's it basically was a you know two a two and a half hour almost three. Uh, what is it? Sigourney Weaver said it's two hours and seventy minutes, um, <laughs> <laughs> a visual treat. You know, so and like like Jaime said, it was amazing to look at. It was a spectacular spectacle, in spectacle, and uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, and you know, notwithstanding not getting your hands cut on a ragged metal, but um, um. It was it was an interesting interesting story, um, but you know it was part National Ge- Geographic kind of like depiction of you know the, the the boy swimming with the whale and you know all that kind of stuff that was kind of all kind of neat stuff. But um, it was you know and then in the typical you know the high school locker room, the you know the hallway the high school hallway drama that happens when a nude kid comes and the and the 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 boy gang is like you know has to you know exert their their authority and and the parents chastise them for you know for picking on the new kid and like all of that stuff like it, it didn't do anything to add to the movie except to make it you know like a human drama yeah you know which begs the question are we not on another planet dealing with aliens you know do they have to have human drama oh. you know I, I think you pretty much summed up, I think, maybe what what all of us feel. I think it's basically, this movie is a treat for your eyes, but it's not for your heart. Yeah. You know? Well, I, I think you said it was not, uh, you said, I think you said the other day that it was, it was a good movie, like, visually, but not so much as a story, right? No, no it's it's just not. And, and you know, and, and I think that's okay. I, I don't think I'd want to do that for every movie experience. You know, say what you will about, you know, the marvels of, of it all. But, you know... There are parts of some of those past Marvel movies, not the last wave was a little up and down, but, uh, you know, there are parts of some of those Marvel movies where you're, you're very emotionally invested. You're, you know, you, you are really rooting for these characters. You really have an affection and a, and a feeling for them. I I just, I really, you know, I think, I I think you and I were sort of chatting quickly in the movie theater, sort of saying, which one is that one? Like, it's just, it's hard. It's hard to care. You know, it's, 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 it, it, doesn't hit you the same way yeah and well this one didn't the other the, i mean the other avatar movie had more of the more of the out of like in body and out of body experience like they there was the sort of conflict with the character sam and and you know the fact that he was replacing his brother and he wasn't physically able um you know and and the the big giant machines to move around and the whole G, uh the Giovanni Giovanni BC, yeah. drama him playing him casually playing you know golf um on on the, the ship and and uh you know the, the scientists you know the scientists kind of like figuring out how to get you know into the into have communication with and learn about the navi and stuff like that and, and then the navi you know kind of society and learning about their big tree of life and all that kind of stuff and i mean that at least had some interesting story bits, right? Mm-hmm. Um, this was definitely from the point of view of of uh, how does this fit into the universe? It's a sequel, right? Mm-hmm. It wasn't, and it wasn't, it wasn't Empire Strikes Back. I'm sorry, you know. Yeah, and, and this one also, I think that's another thing we should just mention is that it's probably a less satisfying ending than the last one because at least at the end of the last one, it was like, well, we've we've driven them off, and hooray for the Navi. Obviously, it could have been a standalone movie by ending it that way. This one was clearly like, see you in two years, suckers. Like it was very yeah, much more back. like yeah. you're you're in it, you're in it. So we're just gonna get back and get some bigger guns and come back again. Yeah, I mean the the the, the spaceships arriving was. I mean they looked amazing, like those mm-hmm. those ships. Mm-hmm. I mean why don't you just go make a space movie with those amazing ships for you know instead of this, right? Mm. You know, it's kind of like it's kind of like aliens, right? And and I guess this, you know the whole aliens universe or the, even the predators universe. Um, after a while, it just becomes, you know, oh, look, another spaceship. Oh, look, they found another planet. Oh, don't open that egg. Oh, no, don't go there. And, you know, you, everybody kind of knows what's going to happen, right? So, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. I, 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 again, like the the, 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 the burning questions again, like, the, you know, the, the, how was the, how was the 15 year old Navi conceived? Um, how, in fact, is now Sam, where's Sam's body? Like, 
you know? Well, um, like, it, yeah, I mean, we did see that at the end of the last movie that he kind of gets sort of, they transfer transferred? him with the tree and stuff like that. And theoretically his, oh, with the tree, right. His yeah, body yeah. And, is theoretically well, it, actually dead, right? Yeah. And actually the, the characters that show up, I mean, this is a bit of a spoiler, but it's revealed early in the movie that the, the, the sergeant, whatever, dickhead, whatever his name is, I can't remember. Um, he comes back, a clone of him is made with his memories. So they've gone back to Earth, they've figured out the science behind, and they've got, they've got like, the kids are like 15, 16 years old, so they had, you know, 15 years to, to go back, figure out the, figure out the magic knobby science, um, and then and come back here. And, and what happened to the unobtainium, right? <laughs> now they're going after this gold and this elixir, you know, like the, the MacGuffin here was the elixir that they're after, right? Yeah, that's it's pretty funny how that you know in the first one it's unobtainium is the most precious thing in the galaxy, and then they're like, no wait, but actually this stuff is the most precious stuff in the galaxy. Yeah, yeah, and it's ultimately a drug, right? It makes you feel better or something like that. Or well, no, it's supposed to, it's supposed to end human aging. That's right? Yeah, it's the, the the fountain of youth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, you know, I, I again after seeing Avatar in the theater. I would have said to people, you have to see this movie in the theater, mm-hmm. right? I don't know that I would say this to people but the, about they this have movie. To see this one. No, I mean, like, you know, you have to go and spend over three hours sitting in a movie uh, with bad popcorn, because we went at the end of the day and the food was horrible. I don't know if yours was, but mine was. Yeah. Because it was like, you know, the end of the shift and the, you know, it wasn't fresh and whatever, but... You know, you, you try and get yourself a big enough drink to survive through the whole movie, <laughs> which is impossible. We'll, right? we'll have to take you know? diet tips from Jaime next time. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I'm surprised that he went from, like, no training. Like, he has not, he hasn't had any any film-going training in the last two years, right? He's been, you know, he went from nothing to, like, this huge marathon thing. Like, you know, get him in the Olympics, you know? Like, he's ready to, He's ready for the decathlon, right? <laughs> anyway, yeah. Let's move on to the watch list. Okay. Watch list. Watch list. So over the uh, holiday break, I caught up on a couple of things. Uh, I watched the Tim Burton uh, produced and actually I was surprised to find actually directed. He directed a bunch of the episodes of this show Wednesday that is on Netflix. Um, you know, I come and go on Tim Burton. I've enjoyed uh, some of his work mm-hmm. over the years and some of it I'm like, oof, a little too far for me. I wasn't sure what to expect, but I, I, I have been an Adams Family fan for a long time. So I thought, well, I'll give it a spin and I'll, I'll watch one and see how, how it goes. And I found myself roped in enough that I thought, okay, well, you know, it's only, I think, eight episodes. I'll, I'll, I'll sort of give it a watch. I've got time. And I ended up enjoying it quite a lot, actually. It's a fun sort of uh, dark comedy. There's a sort of a, a, a monster on the loose and we're not sure why and how. So it's kind of a whodunit and sort of tied in to you know all that and you know really fun performances uh in it you know i really liked uh jenna ortega plays uh plays wednesday and she was a lot of fun you know they definitely had um uh some less conventional choices as far as the the casting uh you know we had um uh uh catherine zeta jones as morticia we had luis guzman as as gomez um so actually having uh latino person playing a latino character which is bizarro um you know uh uh gwendolyn christie's good i really liked uh emma myers who played enid who's wednesday's roommate she was really really charming and very likable it was just a really fun um you know sort of you didn't have to know everything about the sort of Adams family background, but if you did, it was kind of fun, but it was just a fun sort of, I, I was trying to describe it for somebody at work this week. And I said, it reminded me of a cross between Buffy, the vampire slayer and Veronica Mars. It's kind mm, of a, yeah, it's kind yeah. of a, you know, a little bit sleuthy, but also, you know, a little supernaturally and funny. Um, so yeah, I would say, you know, if you, if you, you know, if you're in, if that's your vibe, uh, it definitely has a real feel to it. It's, it's, you know, it, it looks really sharp. Apparently they went to Romania and shot for eight months in this sort of, you know, uh, very unique setting. So it has a real feel to it, which I think is really neat. I like it when they, they actually, it's not just all green screened and whatever. They actually were like, you know, inside this old building and stuff. So that's kind of neat. Um, yeah, I would highly recommend that one. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, we just finished 
my wife and I watching White Lotus. I realize it's a little outside of our purview, but uh, again, a little bit of a whodunit. Really enjoyed that. And then we also finally watched uh, the, the Knives Out sequel, Glass Onion, which, of course, Tim mm. got to see at the film festival. Uh, didn't like it as much as the first one, but um, no. but some great performances. And, and, and I really like Ryan Johnson's writing. I like he's very sharp, uh, sharp ears. So I really like that one as well. But uh, yeah, I would uh, say any of those are definitely worth your time. Cool. What do you got for Sammy? Mine is a uh, nice short little video. It's uh, it's arguably a, a commentary on uh, on legacy sequels, as it says here. So legacy sequels for no reason at all, and it sort of picks apart. I mean, y- y- you could call it the the sequel trilogy for Star Wars. You could call it Indiana Jones. You could call it um, Blade Runner. Um, I think Avatar doesn't quite fall into this trope, but Basically, anything that uh, is a continuation of uh, a sequel from something along a movie long, long ago, uh, you've got the uh, the beloved character with the uh, the iconic object of some sort that's there for fan servicey reasons, and then that character gets replaced by like brand new character that's oddly cynical. Um, give it a watch; it's forty three seconds. I probably spent more time talking about it than you were just watching it. <laughs> <laughs> but like it was timely given that uh, Avatar is is arguably like almost a legacy sequel, right? For given how much time between them. Um I think maybe Ghostbusters Afterlife or Indiana Jones might be uh, might be better choices to to look at this lens. Cool. All right, I have a few um and they're not necessarily falling into our um milieu as it were. Um, first one is Inside Man, which stars, it's from the folks who brought us, uh, the 10th Doctor. It's, um, uh, Moffat and David Tennant. Um, he plays, it's a, basically a, um, sort of a kidnapping, uh, thing. And, uh, how can I explain it? Uh, I, it's kind of, um, Silence of the Lambs meets the Lucy show. <laughs> well, that oh, is a mix. Yes. So, because, I mean, I don't often yell, I mean, I don't often yell at my TV, but I found myself yelling at my TV and like, just stop. Like, what the hell are you doing? Just stop doing this. You know, you don't have to do this. Just, you know, call the cops, turn yourself in enough already. Right. Um kind of sentiment that's right in the first episode and there's it's only four episodes long uh certainly i recommend highly recommend watching it Stan, stanley tucci plays the sort of um hannibal lecter type uh guy he's he's um and it's going to have a second season because they've already they've already set up uh, uh the end sets up uh, the next season and um he plays a, a man on uh, an inmate on death row who's got, you know about to be executed but he's an amazing criminologist and uh, he is remotely like the 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 reporters coming to him with information and he's figuring out what is really going on um and david tennant may or may he plays a, the vic the town vicar and he may you know he's kind of like the town vicar channeling lucy or Net, lucy ball uh you know with the chocolate with the the conveyor belt thing where she you know just starts shoving chocolates in her face and clothing because she can't keep up with what's going on that's kind of like without giving too much away that's kind of where it is it's 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 like it's it, it's silence of the lambs plus lucy show but not funny <laughs> Um, the other, the other one I haven't seen yet, but I'm going to want to, this is on my watch list for this week, probably coming up is white noise. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen anything about it. It's sort of a twisty, futuristic pandemic y kind of end of the world, um, situation where, um, it's the guy that plays, um, uh, the bad guy in the latest star Wars. Um, Oh, Adam is this Driver. the Noah Baumbach thing? Yeah. Oh, it yeah. looks so weird. I tried. Yeah, I yeah. tried to watch. I, I watched the trailer because everyone was like, "Oh, yeah. no, Bombax doing this thing on Netflix." And I was like, "Oh, I'll check it out." And I was like, yeah, "What yeah. the hell is this? It looks so yeah. weird." Yeah, yeah. So there, the, the the trailer is like them in in the middle of a river in a in a station wagon, and he's trying to escape with his with his family. And yeah, it's what's this the guy's name? You know, the guy who plays uh, the bad guy in uh, Kylo Ren. Yeah, 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 Adam uh, Driver. Adam Driver. Adam yeah, Driver. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, he plays a sort of older, you know, 
you know, closer to your age kind of guy, um, you know, with his family trying to get out of the situation. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. I've heard, yeah. I've heard, definitely heard some mixed things about this one. So yeah. So the, the idea is basically that they have to evacuate because there's like this toxic cloud in their town or something. And then they have yeah, to like yeah. basically go on a road trip to, a, you know, it's like a road apocalypse road trip movie. Um, and it's based on a, on a, on a book. Um, oh yeah. But yeah, I've heard people sort of saying like, it's, it was one of those, like, how could they possibly do this well from book to movie deals? And a lot of people were like, some people were like, actually, it's pretty good. And some people were like, oh, my God, no. So it's a little divisive. But, yeah, I, I was curious about this one. I, I was listening to a podcast over the holidays and they were talking about it. And I thought, oh, I should check this one out. And I watched the trailer and I was like, mm, maybe. Well, well, you never know. I mean, like, I, I enjoyed the TV show Station Eleven better than the book. I watched the TV show first and then I w went back and read the book. And I'm not sure that I would have gotten... Um, because the, 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 the plot kind of changes a bit in the TV show, because um, they can't really go into the kind of great detail that they do in, in, uh, as they can in a book, right? But, um, and what was the other one? Uh, anyway, just, yeah, that, that's, that's that. So the other, the other shows I'm watching are National Treasure. It's a um, weekly uh, serial. It takes place after the, was it Book of Secrets or whatever that they had? The first one was about stealing the... The, Declaration of Independence, um, isn't Declaration it? Declaration of Independence to find the Holy Grail. Um, and so uh, the the Nicolas Cage character is not really in this. Uh, one of his assistants turns up uh, about three or four episodes in. Um, it's more from a young, like a uh, Nancy Drew kind of thing. Um, the, the main character is a really good gamer. And... Uh, She's, you know, figuring all this stuff out and she's got some heritage, there's some heritage with her, with the, the Aztecs and the Mayans and because she's from, she's an undocumented, I forget what they call it, DACA, is it called DACA, where they're undocumented second generation American? Do you know what I mean, honey? Yeah, yeah it, it was one of those things where like, well, you can't really control the fact that your, your parents illegally immigrated you into the country, right? So it was like a, a semi-amnesty for those folks. Yeah, but, you know, you do something wrong and they'll send you back to mm -hmm. what's not really your home anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so National Treasure is kind of interesting, interesting thing. And it, and the, you know, the uh, Harvey Keitel character is uh, comes back as the FBI agent. And uh, there's a few characters that come back from uh, the original series or the original two movies that are that are sort of set to set this one up. And and uh, and off we go. Same sort of. If you like Da Vinci Code, kind of um, that kind of stuff, you know, secret chambers and stuff like that. So it's not bad. It's not. It's not. It's not horrible, but it's it's not great TV. But it's not bad TV. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen See How They Run. This is, um, I think it's on the Disney Channel. Yes, um, and it stars uh, Saoirse Ronan, who I just I love mm -hmm. her acting. Mm -hmm. Uh, she plays a the one of the first women constables in uh, you know, probably like the thirties or forties. I think it's it filmed in London. Um, and again, it's, it's sort of a murder mystery thing. And Sam, what's his name? The help me out now. You guys don't even know what I'm talking about. Um, oh, that he's guy. Ameri he's American, but he plays he plays uh, he he plays with a British accent. And it, it's Sam Rockwell. Sam Rockwell. It's passable. It's pa it didn't blow me away. His 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 English didn't. But he plays a really sort of interesting, you know, curmudgeonly um, detective kind of thing who's stuck with this this young whippersnipper. I mean, she's brilliant in the movie, like the, the character, right? Uh, that Saoirse Ronan plays. So, yeah, definitely. Um, Where's that? What's that streaming on? It's on Disney. It's it's a fun one. You and Sherry can... What, I, I told Carol to watch it. It's, it's a murder mystery, right? So Yeah, we do like those. Yeah. And uh, so, as a matter of fact, I'd never seen Hannah... Oh, I which love that is, movie. She's so which good is one in of the, that. Yeah, it's it's kind of like uh, Run Lola Run and uh, uh, like a Mission Impossible James Bond kind of thing. But with right? a child. With a child. Yeah, she plays this murderous, you know, or she's she's basically a weapon of war, kind of trained by her parents um, or trained by MI5 or somebody like that. Yeah, well, her dad Eric Bana is her dad, right? Well, he's not really her dad. It turns out. Yeah. Oh, spoilers! Yeah. Spoilers! Yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah, and and you know how she she kind of you know. Uh, yeah, it's kind of like Born Identity, but like she's like fifteen. Right? Yeah, it's, it's one of her earlier performances, and yeah, I think that was yeah. it was either that or um, she did um, did another movie around that same age. But 
It was the first time I remember seeing her and thinking like, ooh, she's going to be special. Like she, even, it, she carries that movie. And yeah, she can't be like 14, 15 years old. Like she carries that whole movie and she's captivating. That's from 2011. Yeah, just checking it out here. And uh, there's a TV show, I think, on, on Netflix called Hannah, which I think is, it's is a remake, sort yeah. of a continuation of this story. Yeah, right? yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, so it was kind of cool. Um, with Kate Blanchett playing the, the antagonist in this one. Um, and of course, I mentioned a kaleidoscope off the top of the top of the goal here. Um, yeah, I'm interested. I'm three episodes in out of eight, and I'm interested to see how it turns out. And uh, yeah, it's interesting because on our we have a cinephiles uh, chat room in our on our work Slack, and uh, they're all sort of like keep they're they're nobody's spoiling it for each other, but we're all sort of like and what order? It's trying to write down the order in which you you were presented the story to see how to see how your how it affects you in terms of how it's how it's played out so uh, and, but i mean i i don't know why they're, they're trying to figure out how to do this i just go into the, the episodes menu and i can see the order in which i'm going to watch them in right and they'll stay that way for for presumably for me i'm curious to log into one of your accounts and see or for you guys to log in and see what order they're presented to you right mm, so mm-hmm. like i mean the black one and the white one are, are they're they're the, the beginning and the end, but the the black one is like a minute long. It just explains the sort of the um, explains how it works, and then and then you know, and then you're into the movie and you're into the show, and off you go. The white one is the last is the the final episode that ties it all together. But yeah, interesting. Hmm. So far, I so far I've seen like the first two episodes. I saw kind of worked in like chronologically, they worked well together. And then this third one, like I said, is a flashback. So be interesting to see how how they all come together, right? And apparently there's 5,400 and something possible combinations of how you can watch this show. Wow. Yeah, based on based on what? Is it eight times? Is it eight cubed? I mean, I don't know how it works. <laughs> but the math is, right? And that's it for me. And I guess that's it for another week. Uh, of Spotcasts and so Jonathan if people want to get in touch with you where do they find you you can find me on Twitter and Instagram as at JPK News or on YouTube as YouTube.com slash JPK and Jaime if people want to get in touch with you how would they find you I'm on Twitter as at Dev of the Hair all right. My name is Timitra, T-I-M-M-I-T-R-A on the Twitter machine is where you'll find me. Until next time, we'll see you in the future. Bye. 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 You've been listening to the Spotcast Podcast. If you want to find out more about the podcast or see the episode show notes, visit the Spotcast website at spotcast.com. You can get in touch with us on the website or follow us on Twitter at Spotcast. If you have feedback or questions, send us a tweet with the hashtag AskSpotcast. If you like the show, please consider recommending us to a friend, writing a review on iTunes, or pledging any amount at patreon.com slash spotcast. You can find details on how to help us on our website, spotcast.com slash sponsor us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you in the future. playing hockey outside now uh or we could talk about the spockies the sparkies the sparky so i i did that first draft list but i think last year we we decided that maybe we want to change up uh the number of candidates that we put out there for people because that list is huge yeah i can't remember what we and and i wasn't sure was station 11 on last year's i can't remember like because because technically it's a 2021 movie per show but yeah, it's whether or not there was a season during that stretch too, right? I tried to do stuff that was sort of like aired within. Well, the year. I watched it in 2022, so that's why I, cut, I put it on. And the other one was um, Peripheral was on the list. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one to add. Oh, and then and Jamie Lee Curtis for actress in Everywhere, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. Yeah, I thought about that one, but then I cannot imagine that she would outdo Michelle Yeoh in that. But who knows? Oh, okay. 
because we don't really divide it into like supporting and all that stuff too so it's, it really is just a matter of what, what we want to put out there I, I did the same thing I was like well should we just do best actress across the board you know movies and TV but I was like well that seems a little bit cruel because there's some really awesome TV performances too let, let me help you with this because like if you look at best movie right I've not watched Morbius Nope Prey or Sonic the Hedgehog uh, I've only seen one of those so could we lose them and make this that list shorter? We, I don't can't remember. What... I, I guess it depends. I mean, we need we need to find I guess consensus on on on. Well, in last year, what I did was I took all the Star Treks and put them into their own categories, and, and then had people vote on the best Star Trek. Yeah, you can do that too. And we can do the same thing with Star Wars because we have what the yeah we have four Star Wars. Yep. Tales of Jedi. Oh yeah, I think I just started watching that one actually. Yeah. So we move those out to their own two categories, right? Yep. But yeah, I don't know if we want to pare down the lists for some of this other stuff, because I know, um, yeah, like there's a lot of movies there. And again, like, I mean, we, do we really need to have a category called best TV show? Because I think we know what best TV show was well, last year. Right? I mean, to be fair, when I looked at that <laughs> list, when I looked at that best movie list, I was like, there's a clear winner in there for me. And same thing with best, best TV movie? show. And same thing with best, best actor, and same thing with you best. Liked, you liked Uncharted. I don't get it. <laughs> yeah, um, I I found it really easy to pick my winners. Like uh, unlike some yeah. years where I'm like, man, this is tough. The only one that I really kind of struggle with is the um, best actress TV because I think there was so many amazing yeah. performances by women in, te- so, in television last year. Do you know that I've seen everything everywhere all at once at least four times? Yeah, again, maybe three times. Yeah. We'll mm. we'll let the process play out as it may. We do want to obviously engage our fans, but yeah, um, yeah. It's it, some of these are are really kind of you know. Uh, Prey. Which 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 what movies TV shows? Prey. Have I seen that? Prey's on Disney Plus. It's uh it's basically a prequel to Predator. Oh no, I haven't seen that one yet. Uh, okay. Worth a All watch. Right. That's the that's the one I did watch. Um, okay. That one's, it's kind of, uh, it's basically, it's set in like, you know. Um, yeah, don't tell me anymore. I'll watch it. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. It's a prequel to and Predator. Then, now you know. Worth a watch. Right. And then we've got, uh, okay, then we've got the Dr- Dragon Ladies. We've got um, Tetra Masalani. I know Jaime's yeah, okay. most anticipated TV show of 2023 is by far X Men 97. <laughs> it's definitely, it's definitely up there. I don't think that one's going to win uh, for the general crowd. The I, I'll find this one to be interesting because no. there's there's a lot of good shows coming. Although even in the movies category, like I, I made this whole list and I was like, mm, I'm, I'm pretty clear on which my favorite is out of that list. But are oh, the movies coming? You mean? Yeah. Oh, hang on. Uh... It's got to be Dungeons and Dragons Honor Among Thieves. You think? No. But it's not Super Mario Brother. Oh yeah, okay. I see which one it is. Okay, yeah. got it. Um, and then the stuff, the TV shows. Hmm. What's Echo? Echo is the supporting character from the Hawkeye series. The woman. Who oh, okay. Is, uh, and then Good Omens yeah. is Good Omens Part Two or something. Season two, yeah. Season two. Yep. Last of Us. I don't know if I even watched Last of Us. Yep. Loki season two, Mandalorian season three, Secret Invasion. Ahsoka season one, Visions season two, Discovery season five. And again, some of these are speculative. I assume we're going to get more Prodigy and more Lower Decks this season, this year rather. I don't know. They haven't confirmed yeah. that. But So would you really watch a Walking Dead TV show after the blazing? I absolutely would not. But again, if we're opening this up to the general public, maybe that's what Tammy would vote for. Tammy's not watching the Walking Dead either, either anymore. Shocking. Shocking. I know. I know. I told her, there was something I told her to watch the other day. Oh, Doctor Who. She still hasn't seen that. I don't know if she's seen that yet. Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay with this. I, just, I think, I think you know, we could, like I said, we could move the chunk of those movies. Uh, what do you think, Jaime? Like, just move Morbius, Nope, Prey, and... Oh, Prey we can leave in. You've seen Prey, right, Jaime? Or on John? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was okay. on Hulu here in the that, States. Yep. And drop Sonic? What do you think? I think so. Mm-hmm. You could drop... I didn't watch you could Sonic frankly 1. drop Uncharted 2 if you want to. I, I, I'm... Whatever. Yeah, nobody's going to vote for that. <laughs> Did you watch Black um, Adam? I haven't watched that yet. I, I was I queued it no, up. No, I haven't watched Black Adam. I, it's on yeah. Crave here now, and I queued it up uh, over the holidays, but I didn't get a chance to sit down and watch it. I, I watched the first 10 minutes of uh, Venom. What's it called? Yeah. Let There Be Carnage. I, yeah. I made it 10 minutes in. I was like, this is so stupid. And I, I turned it off, and I, I haven't gone back to it yet. So, yeah. 
Slow Horses was was really good. The fin- the finale of season two. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, like it, it. It's such a good show that after we finish recording Spotcast, I go and watch it because mm. <laughs> it's midnight. You know, like by the time it comes out at midnight, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, and and there's five books. I'm just I don't anticipate them doing five seasons, but yeah, it'd be nice if they did. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, if you can find DC's League of Super Pets, I would use that as a Ooh. chaser with Black Adam. Ooh. I think the two make a good pairing. Yeah. I, actually, I, did, I didn't mind League of Super Pets. I actually enjoyed that one. Yeah, I watched that one too. Yeah. 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 It, was, it was better than Pets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean, Pets was pretty, I, Pets was pretty funny, yeah. Yeah. Except for the Louis C.K. angle. Yeah, some things don't hold up well. And and I don't know about you, but are, are you able to watch anything by Will Smith anymore? Uh, I don't know if I've tried. I mean, I I struggle with Kevin Spacey stuff now. That one's a yeah. That I one's just a tough I keep thinking road. about. I think keep think yeah. I keep thinking about going back to well, even after he's been exonerated or whatever. But well, um, okay. Or is that just a bag of cash went across the table and? No, it's. I mean, the issue with a lot of those ones with him is statute of limitations stuff. It's it's awfully hard to get people clear memories and everything else. It's it's just. It's hard. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to go back and watch Baby Driver, but yeah, that's kind of, I mean, not, don't know how you could edit him out of that. <laughs> yeah, that's the one I, I it was one night I think uh, the kids watched, I think um, uh, Xavier and Julia and Sherry watched it, and um, and Sherry said, I forgot that Kevin Spacey's in it, and it really took me out the second he showed up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's funny because I didn't even know who he was when when LA when I saw LA Confidential in the theaters, right? And, and, mm-hmm. and, and mind you, I think he was isn't he the bad guy in Seven? He is, um, and he was in uh, I think Usual Suspects came before. Um, yeah, I don't think I saw Usual Suspects before I saw LA Confidential because that was such a good movie and and amazing that they take out like that that one of the lead characters gets killed in the middle of the movie. I thought that was just amazing. Spoilers, writing, come right? on, man. Oh, come on. How long has it been since LA Confidential well, I, was on? I know for a fact that our number one fan has not seen that movie, so come on. Gotta bleep that part. He doesn't know which character I'm talking about. <laughs> he knows what Kevin Spacey <laughs> looks like. Well, he's not going to watch it because Kevin Spacey's in it. <laughs> you should still watch that movie even though Kevin Spacey's in it because it's a great movie. You should movie. watch Tom Gunn Maverick. <sighs> it it's in my movie. house now. <laughs> Jaime, it's in my house now. It's 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 right downstairs. It's Do you know it's funny. It's funny at this... me because Xavier got the 4K double pack of Top Gun and Top Gun Maverick for Christmas. It's funny, you know. I was, I, yeah, I told him I would go and look through my my movie collection. Guess how many Tom Cruise movies I own? Too many. I own zero. Zero. Yeah, I had I had a Mission Impossible, the one with the Ang Lee one. Yeah, yeah. But I'm sure I gave it away to, at a garage sale because it wasn't one of the better ones. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, in spite of the fact that I've seen Live, Die, Repeat probably like 20 times, um, and I've seen, um, I've seen all of the Mission Impossible ones at least once, um, including Henry, Henry Cavill's mustache, but um, <laughs> the, uh, which is not CGI, by the way. Um, yeah, it, it, I was I was actually oh War of the Worlds. That's another. I think I I think I might have a bootleg of War of the Worlds, but I I don't I never never actually paid money for it, right? Mm. Um, but yeah, I, like I was surprised that that I don't actually own any of these any of these movies, right? So do we Weird. do we want to put a do we want to record a quick plug for the Spockies that you can add into the this week's episode, or do we want to? I guess that's the question. Are we going to do one next week to wrap up? We're we're talking about it now, so it's we'll, in the after show. All right. Um, Although nobody nobody listens to the after show, apparently. Well, there you go. Um, yeah, I just wonder if we want to do something like you know uh, else to let people know, or we're just going to pop it up on social and spread it around that way. That's what I did last year. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, it'd be interesting to see how many more people we get from Mastodon on it because people seem to be more engaged on Mastodon than they are on Twitter. Interesting. Do you know it's interesting? I, just, I heard a stat the other day. There's only hundreds of millions of people on Twitter compared to the billions on Facebook. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but but it's funny that all this this you know people making all this poop and noise about Twitter, right? When it's it's like doesn't even hold a candle to. It's like Apple compared to Windows, right? Apple is is well, you know. There's a reason, and it's because boomers don't like Twitter because it's more complicated. They like Facebook because it's dog simple. simple yeah and yeah. so everybody over the age of forgive me tim 60 is on facebook 
Yeah, well, I don't. Even, I don't. Even, I think uh, I even have people in their forties who are barely able to do Twitter. I, I know tons of people who don't do Twitter, right? Like, yeah. But yeah, you're right. Everybody does Facebook. Yeah, I mean, even like you know, I know some some Gen Alpha and some you know uh, you know Gen Z kids who, and millennials who are, still have a Facebook page just because they know that that's where grandma is or that's where you know like well that's the only reason to have it yeah you know all these like uh, i primarily what i use it for is i mean one for work obviously but um but also just because i know uh yeah like that's if i post pictures of my family on there it's going to make its way to australia and the east coast and all these other places where we have yeah, you know totally family members totally. who are you know subscribers like that's that's why yeah totally yeah and um hmm. So oh, it's an interesting stat I heard the other day because, you know, the whole new year and, and the, the clock changing over and this arbitrary position of the earth and as it circles the you know, the sun. Um, Jaime, you're a millennial? Technically, yes. I am the oldest possible millennial. Uh, oh, you're the oldest. Year. Okay, because I heard the other day, I heard that the, I think the youngest millennials are now 40. Is that right? No, they can't yeah, be that, the, that... the old. That's that's too close to me. So I'm about to turn 42 in a, in a few months, and I'm one of the oldest. I I'm in the the oldest year, which is uh, 81. So you're yeah, subtract I'm, 15. I'm one of the younger Gen Xs too, like uh, one of the last generation. Okay, of generation so maybe X. so maybe the stat was that the the um, oldest millennials are now over 40. Yeah, yeah. So it says 81 to 96, according to Wikipedia yeah. here. So yeah. yeah, you know, shave off. So you know, you figure they're closer to almost thirty. The youngest millennials. What do you qualify as, Tim? I guess you're you're sort of right. I'm at, a late boomer. Right I'm the a late the boomer. Boom, right? Yeah. I'm the I'm the second gen boomer. Yeah. 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 Because I'm sort of towards towards the end side of of Gen X. Um, both both Sherry and I, and then. Um, yeah, or by the there's, so, the there's so many boomers, so many boomers that they decided to make two generations of us. Yeah. Yeah, I'm um, in the second gen. Yep, I'm gonna miss them. Ooh, boy, am I gonna miss them? Boomers. <sighs> you know the you know the tool that they use in Logan's Run where you hit thirty. Can yeah. we set one of those up for the boomers, please? You know, in the book it was twenty one. Oh wow, well, then I'm fine. Climb, climb me aboard. It's I had a good run. Yeah. I actually watched that the other day because uh, I think you, one of you guys gave it to me, but I, I think I, I gave it to you it. a number of years ago. Yeah, I, it's still in the cellophane, but I, I think it was on. I think it's on Disney Plus. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, I watched it the other day. It's actually it's actually not a bad movie. I remember again that was one of the first uh, first movies I I think I probably saw it when I was about twelve or so. And there's the scene with Jenny Jenny Attaker 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 Yeah, she ends up getting all wet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And back you know back then like as george lucas used to say there's no underwear in space um <laughs> hey jenny yeah. agater was a beautiful woman back in the day i mean she's still oh, a beautiful yeah. woman she's only yeah, you yeah. Know, she's probably what in her 70s now i think she just yeah uh, let's see yeah just turned 70 um yeah that's true yeah she we was just she was lost gorgeous. uh we just lost um what's her name from mrs peel from the avengers last year mm -hmm. um diana rake yeah. yeah oh she again she was a stunning woman back in the day too but then she was one of my very favorite parts of the Game of Thrones series, too. Even, you know, that much sure, later yeah, on. Yeah. Like she was an yeah. amazing actress. Absolutely phenomenal. Woman to be reckoned with, yes, she definitely. Was, from beginning to end, from the beginning of the to the end of the year, she just had a real presence. She was a, she was a broad. She was great. Yeah, definitely. Cool. All right. Well, uh, in less than 12 hours, I'm going to be sitting in an airport. Fun. Fun, wow. Have a nice that funeral. And there's no there's no um, slow horses episode for me to watch tonight. Well, oh well. Are you are you tomorrow, actually but... flying with your sisters, or are you flying? <laughs> Did you were you like? I'll, I'll am meet, I I'll am I you flying there? with? Am I flying? Is this show going to be on the air? Am I flying with my sisters? Am I renting a car with my sisters? Am I staying in a bed and breakfast or oh, oh, Airbnb wow. with my sisters for the whole weekend? So, oh yeah, so, oh yeah. So you're bringing some kind of uh, uh, um, self medication to deal with this, right? You know. Something. Well, it's kind of like it's kind of like um, one year my one of, I think one of my nephews, I think the second one was getting third one was getting married, 
mm. um, in Ottawa, and somebody thought, hey, wouldn't it be fun if Tim and Carol, you can imagine who came up with this idea, um, took my mom, my uncle, and my aunt, who were <laughs> all at the time in their in the 80s. 80s. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, actually, mom... Yeah, mom was already in, and she was already in the retirement home. Um, the the three of them plus, and and literally the the uh, the the venue for the event was across the street from the hotel we were staying in, and we still had to sh- get load three eighty year olds into the van and drive across the street, <laughs> and then unload them. Good times. Yeah. Well, you know. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with with the. the fortunately, I I'm renting the car, so I know. But I've been like I'm I've been that in my cousin Andrew's place a few times, and we're going like the, the, we weren't going to rent a car. We we're just going to take it, like a cab or whatever because the airport in Fredericton is like miles away from the city, mm-hmm. right? It's like a twenty minute drive. So um, you're not that far from Andrew's place. No, but Andrew is like he's out of. Fredericton. He's almost up there. He's up in Mactaquac. Yeah, I know. I've been to the house in Mactaquac. Oh, you've been there. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's it's a hike from even from yeah. Fredericton. It's yeah. like a good 25, 30 minute drive, right? Yeah, so yeah. needless to say, I didn't want to do that in a cab or whatever. Yeah, so yeah. so it just made more sense to rent a car. Yep. Well, and thankfully there were cars to rent this time. Give everyone my uh, condolences. Obviously, very sad news about your uncle, but uh, but uh, and more importantly, good luck to you this weekend. Thank you. I think I'm going to need it. It's, it's, it's um, you know, I'm, I'm taking the day off, I guess, so I can relax before the ordeal. Pack, pack the Advil. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's Condolences and hope the, the trip goes well, the travel part. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at least I have a podcast to consume my time to edit. So. There you go. <laughs> Sorry, I have to go edit the podcast the, now. We did him a favor, Jaime. Am <laughs> I going extra long? Right. All right. Hey, Jaime, when are we going to be able to do a video episode of this show? Well, uh, we'll have to pick one uh, one time so I can be uh, all spiffy. I'm usually not when we record. Yeah. Oh, are you? Okay. Tim didn't give me a lot of notice on the uh, episode we did two weeks ago. He was just like, hey, you want to do a video? And I was like, well, I haven't shaved. I'm, yeah, I probably should put on a clean <laughs> I shirt. I don't care what you look like. Yeah, yeah, you don't yeah. care. You know, I was like, you know. I'm with Jaime. I would have liked to have, like, you know, put my best foot forward on a video document, but that's all right. Ah. What's the worst that can happen? Um, Just assume I look that old every and video that you're in is one that, yeah, exactly. Like, I don't want it to become, you know, evidence in some jury trial. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> no, no, you don't understand. I got asked at the last minute and I didn't prepare. It's not the way I normally look. Yeah, have you ever seen Nick Nolte's mugshot? That's, yeah. that's, there's a reason why every once in a while you got to just make sure your hair's okay, try to shave, mm. you know, change <laughs> right. your shirt recently. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Yeah, well, whatever. I don't got to look at it. I guess, but I do have to look at it. Um, all right. All right. But on that note, we'll talk to you guys later. Talk to you next week. Talk to you later. Okay, bye. Bye. bye.